Good morning, members of the committee. I call this hearing of the Senate uh, Committee on Agriculture, Nutrition, and Forestry to order. Uh, today's hearing marks this committee's ninth hearing this year, uh, dedicated to listening to our stakeholders from around the country on how our authorized programs are currently working or need improvement as we work towards uh, Farm Bill reauthorization during this Congress. This includes taking a look at spending requests and proposals for 39 programs in the Farm Bill that do not have a budget baseline. And as I've said at each of these hearings, our committee must be mindful of the very tough budgetary environment that we, that we have to face. While it is a principal duty of this committee to ensure the next Farm Bill provides our nation's agriculture producers with the necessary tools and resources to feed a growing and hungry world, our responsibilities and the role of the USDA do not stop there. It is also critical the next Farm Bill works to support rural businesses and cooperatives and health clinics and schools, renewable energy and bio-based product manufacturers and other essential service providers. They all serve as the backbone of the communities our farmers and ranchers call home. Earlier this year, at our committee's first field hearing in Manhattan, Kansas, home of the ever optimistic and fighting wildcats, <laughs> we had the opportunity to hear from a number of stakeholders that I believe share much of the same passion to, and commitment to rural America as our witnesses today. And to the witnesses, I apologize for the lateness of the hearing. Thank you for being very patient. We listened to the manager at the Nemaha Marshall Electric Cooperative explain how low interest rural utilities service Electric loans make it possible for small, small cooperatives to provide rural Kansas with affordable and reliable energy. A Kansas biofuels producer spoke about the important role renewable energy plays in helping to create rural jobs and a new market demand for a number of commodities important to all of our member states. And we heard a rural telecom provider uh, discuss daily challenges that she faces and working to provide high-speed broadband to an area in western Kansas roughly the size of Connecticut and Vermont, except nope, the, just the, the distinguished chairman from Vermont, uh, or the, um, the senator from Vermont has, uh, has departed. But with three million uh, fewer people. I hope today's hearing will continue that conversation and provide our committee's opportunities to hear a broader perspective of, of the needs throughout uh, farm country. On our first panel today, we are pleased to have the assistance of the Secretary of Agriculture for Rural Development and the three acting administrators for the Rural Utilities Service, Rural Housing Service, and Rural Business uh, Cooperative Service. They will discuss Secretary Purdue's vision for fostering growth and economic prosperity throughout uh, rural America and provide an update on program functions within the, within the USDA uh, Rural Development. For our second witness of panels, or pardon me, witnesses, we will hear from a broad set of private sector stakeholders, including representatives of rural cooperatives who work every day to provide essential utility services to farmers, ranchers, and small towns all across the country. They include a nonprofit organization that provides training and other support for small business development, a university professor leading state-of-the-art research in renewable uh, chemical product development, and finally, an, <clears throat> an entrepreneur whose business model is helping farmers and other small businesses save on energy costs through the installation <clears throat> of renewable energy systems. Again, I look forward to our discussions today regarding the rural development and energy titles of the Farm Bill <clears throat> and to hearing from our witnesses about their uh, recommendations to improve these programs and provide our rural communities with the necessary economic tools they need to grow and thrive. It's my privilege now to represent Senator Stabenow for any opening remarks she would like to make. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing. Uh, it, this is such an important hearing to discuss issues that are so critically important to small towns and rural communities in Michigan and Kansas and all across the country. And I want to welcome our witnesses to, today. Thank you for your work. Earlier this year, we held a hearing to examine the state of the farm and rural economy. There, we heard loudly and clearly that those who live and work in rural America are facing tough economic times. But we also learned that there are many opportunities to invest in the future of our small towns and rural communities, create good-paying jobs and keep them 
and help them get back on a good track. Rural communities are often the first to feel the effects of an economic downturn and the last to see the impacts of an improving economy. As a result, we should be making more investments in rural America, not less. Looking ahead to the next Farm Bill, we need to think strategically about how we can achieve long-term economic growth in every region of the country. I've always said that the Farm Bill is a jobs bill. The rural development and energy titles that we're discussing today have a wealth of opportunities to provide a bright future for rural America. I grew up in one of those small towns in northern Michigan, and I know uh, how important it is that we have robust uh, economic development efforts, uh, support for agriculture, and support for business expansion. So strengthening our rural communities uh, and ensuring a high quality of life that young people will want to go home to is very personal for me. In order to, for our communities to thrive, they need to be able to compete in the 21st century economy. Improving access to high-speed internet is one of the top ways to make sure that that happens. US, USDA provides critical support and capital to expand broadband access. We need to strengthen the tools available to extend high-speed internet to every corner of the country. We also need to continue investing in other forms of rural infrastructure. It's unacceptable that there are small towns that cannot afford to modernize their water systems to provide clean drinking water. Small businesses need access to capital as well. Rural business loans help entrepreneurs grow their businesses while also offering new employment opportunities for the community at large. We need to continue to invest in innovation that will keep driving these economies forward. In Michigan, agriculture and manufacturing are the heart of our economy. We don't have a middle class unless we make things and grow things. That's why we created opportunities in the last Farm Bill to support bio-based manufacturing. Instead of using petroleum, companies are creating new products from American-grown crops. The economic benefit is twofold, new markets for our farmers and new jobs and manufacturing opportunities for our businesses. Additionally, the Farm Bill invests in renewable energy, which also leads to job creation. According to a new report, there are now 92,000 clean energy jobs in Michigan alone. The popular Rural Energy for America program, known as REAP, helps producers and businesses lower their utility bills through installing renewable energy systems <clears throat> and making energy efficiency upgrades. Innovations in advanced biofuels are helping us to become more energy independent and pay less at the pump. It's clear the opportunities we create <coughs> Excuse me. We created in the 2014 Farm Bill are helping our small towns create jobs and support communities where parents want to raise their children. So as we begin work on the next Farm Bill, I look forward to building on that progress to help rural America reach its full potential. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the uh, Senator. Mr. Chairman. The uh, distinguished uh, uh, senator is recognized. Mr. Chairman, um, <clears throat> in the event I can't get back or have a witness I'd like to introduce, is that possible? For it's on the second panel. That I think right? that's uh, certainly possible. Okay. Well, Mr. Chairman, I uh, I just want to first off thank you and uh, Senator Stabno for having this hearing. This is an important title in the Farm Bill, and um, I have a, a panelist today from South Dakota, a good friend, uh, Denny Law, very incredibly capable general manager and CEO of Golden West uh, Telecommunications Cooperative, which is headquartered in Wall, South Dakota. Um, his company uh, serves my hometown of Murdo, South Dakota, where my dad still lives. He'll be 98 in December. He uh, spends a lot of time watching cable and on the internet, and he's probably one of my most informed and least patient constituents because uh, <laughs> inevitably he calls me to complain about whatever it is he's seeing and that we're doing. But Golden West was, uh, has been around for a long time, since 1916. They provide 
telephone, internet, and cable services across the state. And Denny has a 27-year history in that industry, all in South Dakota, serving both East and West River. And what makes his current job as CEO of Golden West Telecommunications Cooperative so challenging is his company's location in one of the most rural areas of the country, with ranch and farming operations positioned miles apart and often one to two hours from a larger city like Rapid City. Yet Denny has managed to meet the rural broadband challenges by developing reliable broadband in this area, providing access for jobs, education, and health care. Denny's helped keep a large part of rural South Dakota in touch with the necessities and benefits of the telecommunications industry that most of us in other parts of the country take for granted. Denny has served as general manager of Sioux Valley Telephone Company and Hills Telephone Company in Del Rapids, South Dakota. He went on to become the Eastern Region Manager at Golden West, and he served as CEO of Golden West since 2008. He's got a bachelor's degree in science and journalism from South Dakota State University. He went on to receive his master's in administrative studies and human resources from the University of South Dakota, which means he's very conflicted when it comes to the uh, football season. But I want to thank Denny for uh, appearing before this committee and for sharing your recommendations on how this committee, through the next Farm Bill, can help you and your company improve access to broadband in rural areas. So welcome, and I uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for that indulgence, and uh, appreciate having uh, Denny Law here today. Well, thank you, Senator. I know you're very busy and uh, urge you to keep working on tax reform as a uh, very important member of the Finance Committee, more especially in behalf of the Thune Roberts Amendment, as it's known in South Dakota, or the Roberts Thune Amendment, as it's known in Kansas. <laughs> We're going to introduce the first panel uh, of witnesses today. Ms. Ann Hazlitt currently serves as assistant to the Secretary for USDA Rural Development. An Indiana native, uh, Ann has worked on agriculture and rural issues for over 15 years. Working in both the U.S. House and Senate, Ann has most recently served as Republican Chief Counsel for the Senate Committee on Agriculture, uh, Nutrition, and Forestry, in addition to her public service in Washington. Ann was the Director of Agriculture for her home state, where she managed the Indiana State Department of Agriculture and was an advisor to the uh, a governor at that time, uh, Governor Mitch Daniels, on agriculture and also rural issues. Outside of public service, Ann was in private law practice where she advised clients on agriculture and environmental regulatory matters. She is a graduate of Kansas State University, uh, graduating magna cum laude with a Bachelor of Science degree in agriculture communications. In addition, she holds a law degree from Indiana University and a master's degree in agriculture law from the University of Arkansas. And we are delighted to have you before our committee today. Welcome back. The next witness is Mr. Rich Davis. Uh, uh, Rich has been serving as the Deputy Administrator for uh, Community Programs and Rural Development since August of uh, 2010. The uh, uh, community programs provide direct and guaranteed loans and grants to help our rural communities develop or improve their essential community facilities for public uh, use in rural areas. Uh, these facilities include health care, schools, public safety, and a variety of other uh, project types. Sir, we thank you for your service and thank you for being here today. Joining us next is Mr. Chad Parker. Mr. Parker currently serves as Deputy Administrator for uh, Cooperative Programs and has worked in the Department of Agriculture and Rural Development for more than 26 years. <coughs> In his current capacity, Mr. Parker manages a team that provides assistance to rural communities in the areas of uh, cooperative development, research and education, uh, cooperative statistics, regional strategic planning, and place-based initiatives. That's quite a list. Hard to pronounce all those things with the T's in them. Thank you for your service, sir. Our last witness on this panel is Mr. Christopher McLean. Mr. McLean is the Acting Director of the Rural Utility Service, RUS. He oversees the operations of the Planning, Policy, and Finance Agency focused on rural, electric, uh, telecommunications, broadband, water, and sewer systems. Thanks to all the witnesses for being here today. And why don't you kick off? Good morning, Chairman Roberts, Ranking Member Stabenow, and members of the committee. I'm truly honored with this opportunity to discuss prosperity in rural America, a passion that I know that I share uh, with each of you here today and a topic that is of critical importance as you write the next Farm Bill. Growing up in Indiana, agriculture and small towns have been my life's calling. 
Starting in the 4-H program as a young girl, I followed my love of farming and rural places through college and into law school so I could be an advocate for rural America. Over the course of my career, I've been blessed to serve as counsel to both the House and Senate Agriculture Committees during drafting of the 2002, 2008, and 2014 Farm Bills. I've also had a chance to represent the rural interest in my home state as Director of Agriculture. In each of these chapters, I've developed a sincere appreciation for the role of policy and partnerships in assisting rural communities craft and execute a vision for their future. I also have a deep, res deep respect for each of you as chief advocates for the rural interests of your state and, and an understanding of the monumental challenges that you face in writing a single bill that will meet so many different needs. As you prepare to begin writing the next Farm Bill, I will start with what you already know from many of the states that you represent, which is the fact that conditions in many rural communities are incredibly challenging. Today, 85% of the poorest counties in America are in rural areas. When kids get older and look to begin their careers, very few come home to the towns in which they grew up. And in many small towns, there's simply not the access to critical infrastructure that folks need to stay connected to a modern economy. When we look at these challenges, whether in Kansas or Michigan, North Dakota or Indiana, we are asking, what can we at USDA do to make a difference to help build prosperity in these treasured places? In answering that important question, I have found that the best answers come from the ground outside of D.C. Just last week, I made a visit to Olivia, Minnesota, which is a small city that has recently built a daycare facility. Asking how the town had come to make this forward-looking investment, I was told by a local official that the reason was simple. When any site selector comes to visit their town, they are always looking for four things, he told me, daycare, high-speed internet, good roads, and rail access. At USDA Rural Development, we want to be a partner to communities like Olivia in building prosperity. Through the Farm Bill, Congress has provided tools to assist in many of these needs. As we look to enhance the use of these resources, Secretary Purdue has set several priorities for our team at USDA. First, we are focused on partnerships and coordination. Secretary Purdue is leading a task force on agriculture and rural prosperity that has brought together the many federal agencies and departments that impact rural communities. In this effort, we are developing action-based solutions for four key issues that are impacting rural America, quality of life, the rural workforce, innovation, and economic development. With these federal resources, we will then be looking to work in strong collaboration with our many partners at the state and local level who are on the front lines making a difference in these communities. Second, we are tackling infrastructure needs that I know are a key issue in many of your states. Put simply, robust modern infrastructure is a necessity, not an amenity for rural America. With that, the administration has proposed the creation of a new infrastructure fund that would offer a more flexible uh, source of investment tools to respond to the needs of rural America, such as broadband connectivity. Finally, we are focused on innovation, finding new ways to assist rural communities in addressing the many challenges and opportunities they face. Earlier this month, Secretary Purdue announced his intention to create a Rural Development Innovation Center. Led by an innovation officer, this team will house several important functions, such as data policy and trend analysis. We hope with this addition that the center will help our agency become more forward-focused and better equipped to assist communities in developing effective grassroots solutions. In closing, I want to extend a heartfelt thank you for what you do each day to be a strong voice for rural America. As you move forward in writing this next Farm Bill, Secretary Purdue and I are committed to working with each of you to ensure that rural America is a place of prosperity for generations to come. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ann. Mr. Davis. Good morning, Chairman Roberts, Ranking Member Stabenow, and members of the committee. I appreciate this opportunity to testify before you today. Let me begin by thanking Congress for its ongoing support of rural communities. With your support, the Rural Housing Service, or RHS, has made significant and transformative investments to strengthen the nation's small towns and rural communities. Rural development's fundamental mission is to increase economic opportunity and improve the quality of life in rural America. The Community Facilities Program, a key part of the RHS portfolio, supports this mission by investing in critically needed community infrastructure. Our program provides rural America with access to much needed capital where financial options are, are limited or non-existent. 
In recent years, demand for the low-cost, long-term financing has surged, and the direct program has experienced a nine-fold increase in funding level. Community Facilities expects to utilize 100% of all of its appropriated funds this fiscal year and continues to maintain a strong pipeline of projects for next year. Currently, the total portfolio of Community Facilities investments is $8.8 billion, with the majority invested in the rural health care sector, educational facilities, public buildings, and public safety infrastructure. The financial health of our portfolio remains strong, and the direct loan program will have a negative credit subsidy rate in fiscal year 18. The unique flexibility of community facilities also lends itself well to addressing current issues and challenges facing rural America. As you know, rural towns and communities have been hit hard by the opioid crisis. RHS can play an important role in mitigating the impact of the opioid crisis in rural America by strengthening investment in mental and behavioral health care and other facilities that provide treatment, prevention, and recovery support. Community Facilities also continues to prioritize investment in the future of rural America's children by supporting a wide range of daycare and educational facilities, including charter schools. A positive start will provide rural children with opportunities to further education and achievement. Building on this foundation, this program also strongly supports rural higher education institutions to meet critical regional industry needs and physician and other skilled professional shortages across rural America. In recent years, as the size and complexity of our projects has grown, Community Facilities has taken a leadership role in facilitating public-private partnerships to leverage critical financial, project management, technical expertise, and innovation to leverage large, complex community infrastructure projects. Public-private partnerships enable our programs to serve more rural communities and assist more rural residents with economic growth, job creation, and access to critical services. As we move forward, RHS is confident that it will successfully implement the programs needed for a thriving rural America. Thank you again for this opportunity to share with you how RHS expands economic opportunity in rural America through improving the quality of life for rural residents every day. Thank you. We thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Davis, or especially for being on time. Mr. Parker. Good morning. Good. Chairman Roberts and members of the committee, thank you for this opportunity to discuss our programs at the Rural Business Cooperative Service. Rural development has consistently been the leading advocate for strengthening our nation's rural economies through increasing access to capital in rural areas and expanding the bioeconomy, including supporting opportunities for biofuels and renewable energy. Rural Development's programs and services, in partnership with other public and private sector funding, are, they are at the forefront of improving the lives of rural Americans. Our programs not only promote rural business employment opportunities, they keep jobs in rural America and help rural economies compete in the global marketplace. To date, in fiscal year 2017, the Rural Business Cooperative Service has successfully delivered approximately $1.7 billion in funding to rural Americans that help 12,500 businesses create or save about 55,000 jobs. Our path forward is to focus on our ability to efficiently and responsibly provide government services that meet the needs of rural Americans. Rural Business Cooperative Service remains committed to revitalizing rural communities by expanding economic opportunities, creating jobs, improving rural infrastructure, and expanding markets for existing rural businesses in order to ensure a vibrant economy. We administer numerous direct loan, guaranteed loan, and grant programs that not only directly make capital available, but more importantly, attract investment capital to rural areas that might not otherwise see such investments. Rural Business Cooperative Service continues to be a leader in helping ensure America's energy independence and security, promoting the creation and expansion of renewable energy projects and jobs in rural America. We currently administer a suite of programs that promote a more sustainable energy future. The Rural Energy for America program, or REAP, is our most successful and competitive renewable energy program. REAP promotes energy efficiency and renewable energy development for agricultural producers and rural small businesses. In fiscal year 2017 alone, REAP will provide funding for over 1,200 projects, 
with total project costs over $1 billion and leveraged nearly 18 times the amount of REAP budget authority provided for the year. Cooperatives are an important business model and the cornerstone for business development in many rural communities. Cooperatives provide rural residents with job opportunities, enhanced educational and health care services, and products that enable them to compete in the global economy. Cooperatives create local job opportunities, and cooperative revenues are maintained and recirculated locally. One of the largest and most popular opportunities for cooperatives is the Value Added Producer Grant Program. The Value Added Producer Grant Program provides grants to agricultural cooperatives and producers. The grant funds may be used for planning activities and for working capital, for marketing value-added agricultural products, and for farm-based renewable energy, enabling America's producers to compete in the global economy. The Rural Business Cooperative Service is committed to promoting economic prosperity in rural communities through improved access to capital and economic development on a regional scale. As we move forward in the new fiscal year, we continue to examine our operations and look for opportunities to create efficiencies and seek opportunities to target and leverage resources for the greatest impact. Thank you for the time, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. It's truly an honor to be here today, and I hope my testimony proves to be informative. I'm sure it will. Thank you, uh, Mr. Parker. Thank you for your 26 years. Mr. McLean. Chairman Roberts, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today and thank you for your support for rural electric, water, telecommunications, and broadband infrastructure investment through the Rural Utilities Service. The recent storms of this season remind us how important basic utility infrastructure is to the quality of our lives. The heroic response of legions of rural utility workers helping damaged systems restore power, communications, and water illustrates the true spirit of rural America and the long-term success of the public-private partnership that has been nurtured by this committee and the USDA. USDA investments in basic infrastructure help deliver reliable and affordable electricity, faster internet service, and clean, safe water to help healthy rural communities grow and prosper. Today, our rural utilities portfolio of loans outstanding is nearly $60 billion. Our annual program level is approximately $9 billion. In our electric program, our U.S. funding is helping utilities strengthen rural electric infrastructure. Our electric partners are replacing aging plant, investing in smart grid technologies to increase efficiency, expanding transmission capacity, and hardening the grid against natural and man-made disaster. This fiscal year, RUS expects to obligate over $4 billion in improvements in every element of the electric grid, as well as new investments in energy efficiency and renewable energy. Our telecommunications program finances broadband and advanced telecommunications services. Data shows that nearly 40% of rural Americans lack access to robust, reliable, modern broadband service. During the FY17, RUS expects to obligate over $427 million for state-of-the-art telecommunications and broadband technologies in some of the nation's more remote areas. These investments connect communities to the information age and the world to rural America's talents, services, and products. The RUS Community Connect and Distance Learning Grant programs are making profound differences in the communities they serve. So far this year, RUS has obligated nearly $6 million to fund first-time broadband service in some of the most underserved communities, and $24 million for distance learning and telemedicine projects. In our water and environmental programs, RUS works to maximize limited loan and grant funds to support water and wastewater projects, often serving some of the most financially needing communities in our nation. We are focused on helping communities provide the quality water and wastewater services that are essential to the health, safety, and economic future of those who live and work in and around small-town America. For FY17, the water program expects to use over $1.7 billion to build or improve water and waste facilities. For our entire agency, RUS continues to work to streamline our procedures, better coordinate our efforts, and automate where we can. For example, our new RD Apply system is allowing borrowers and the agency to reduce paper, speed approval, and enhance efficiency. We continue to work to improve the customer experience as well as make sound decisions that deliver value to the American taxpayer. 
Thank you again for the opportunity to discuss how RUS works to support increased economic opportunity and the quality of life in rural America. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. McLean, and thanks to all of the, uh, the witnesses. And let's start off with you. Share with us uh, your vision under Secretary Purdue's leadership. Uh, this is new uh, for the Rural Development uh, Innovation Center. Is there a particular example you could tell us about regarding how the center would improve the assistance provided to our rural communities? Thank you for that question, Chairman Roberts. Um, Secretary Purdue's vision is that we use our resources um, at rural development, both our programs and people, to partner with rural communities and rural prosperity. And one of the ways that we want to do that is through innovation. Um, I mentioned this uh, innovation center that he's announced his intention to create. This is a team that's going to work alongside the three agency administrators and carry out a number of important activities, um, such as data analysis and program outcomes measurement. We're also looking to drive some other activity from the center um, that would be designed to foster capacity building um, and partnership development. Um, a specific example I think that I can give is in the area of trend analysis and partnerships. Um, when we think about communities in rural America and some of the, the challenges that they face, whether it's the loss of a particular sector of its economy or the rise of a new health challenge, such as the opioid epidemic, uh, we hope that an, a team of um, folks devoted to innovation can help those communities by identifying best practices um, that have been successful in other communities addressing that same issue and link them where appropriate to other program tools or other partnerships. I have a specific example I guess I can share recently from Kansas. I had an opportunity um, to visit on rural health care with Secretary Jackie McClaskey as well as um, Mr. Holdren from the Kansas Farm Bureau, they were interested in um, how the challenge of recruiting doctors to rural communities. We had a discussion about best practices and pilot initiatives that could be driven, and I think that's a specific example of an issue that is in many other states as well that the innovation team could help with. I appreciate that very much, uh, Mr. Davis. I co-sponsored a bill earlier this year which would um, prioritize uh, the uh, community uh, facility funding for the construction of or improvements to addiction treatment, as mentioned by Ann. Could you comment on the demand your agency has seen over the past couple of years for projects focused on addiction treatment? I think we have a big problem out there. Yes, sir. Thank you for that uh, question. Chairman Roberts, I agree. We have seen an up uptick in the interest in uh, these facilities. Um, the, uh, in the past fiscal year, checking our numbers, we've invested in uh, $300 million of, uh, of substance abuse, uh, substance use disorder type facilities to, to treat folks with those, uh, with those issues. And currently, we're seeing a pipeline going into um, fiscal year 18 of about $400 million in these uh, in the needs for these facilities. So I would say yes, uh, we're seeing that need and, uh, and uh, thank you for, for the funding we've received to help uh, invest in those types of facilities. I appreciate that very much. Mr. Parker, you oversee a wide variety, to say the least, of programs that assist uh, rural businesses. Can you discuss how the particular programs currently within your purview are geared towards stimulating rural economies in a targeted way? Thank you for the question, Chairman Roberts. Um, yes, uh, we, our rural business cooperative service programs um, provide loans, grants, and guarantees, but they also do uh, numerous other targeted ways uh, to improve rural American and rural business lives. Uh, some of the ways are we provide one by having that field staff working in, in each of our rural communities. They can work with the, the business organizations. They can work with the local lenders to make sure there's access to capital and that they understand how to, to reach those pieces of capital. Um, our, some of our programs allow community lenders, banks, or, and other types of lenders to, because we put a guarantee on those loans, they're able to um, sell portions of those, those loans out to the secondary market, allowing them to continue to lend in their community beyond what their normal lending limit would be. Um, 
We also have programs that reduce energy cost uh, for the ag producers and rural small businesses through energy efficiency and renewable energy, allowing those businesses to prosper and be more viable in the rural economy. We have programs that help create new markets for our ag producers, uh, allowing them to gain the revenues from value-added products. We have uh, programs that allow farm credit institutions to gather funds and invest in a strategic manner uh, through investment funds into rural communities. We have ways that uh, providing resources and activities around the development of cooperatives and the development of new businesses, uh, providing funding to organizations that assist in those ways. We have programs that provide technical assistance, job training, and feasibility studies so that our rural businesses uh, aren't wasting the capital that they go in and invest. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I have one real uh, quick question for you. Uh, Mr. McLean, um, and this was for the entire panel, but time does not permit me to ask you this, uh, this, uh, uh, this one question uh, to all of you. Uh, Mr. McLean, um, what would be the key challenge that you face administering uh, rural development programs that are authorized in the Farm Bill? Can you name me, you know, give me your key challenge? Thank you, uh, Senator. I, I would say that the key issue for our U.S., we have a, a, a passion for broadband deployment. We're um, anxious to be able to connect all of rural America. Um, our primarily, primary tool that we have available to us are, are loan dollars. And those, lo those loans depend significantly on revenue streams that are um, under the jurisdiction of the Federal Communications Commission. And the uh, key challenge for us is to be able to make long-term lending uh, based on the promise of the Telecom Act of 1996 of specific, predictable, and sufficient universal service support. And where we see stability in those support levels, we see growth and demand for our loan products where we have uncertainty of the predictability of that support. Uh, there is a hesitancy of the private sector to be able to invest um, in telecommunications in rural areas. The good news is in Kansas, they're figuring it out. Um, we have some of our finest um, borrowers and great examples. Um, in fact, we, we, uh, we recently uh, approved a Crockhan, Kansas, uh, loan in our uh, senior loan committee and um, we have RTC in uh, western Kansas that is doing wonderful things there but it is a big big challenge and it depends very much on revenue sources that are beyond the control of the um, service provider and beyond the control of the agency. Thank you very much. Senator, uh, Senator Stavano. Thank you Mr. Chairman and welcome again to all of you and I appreciate your work. Uh, Ms. Hazup, first of all, welcome back to the committee. Uh, it's uh, uh, wonderful to have you back with us. And broadly, uh, before getting into specifics, uh, I know that you said in your testimony that the USDA Rural Development, thanks in part to uh, the Farm Bill, is the only agency in the federal government that has the distinct mission of creating jobs in rural areas, supporting small businesses, basic infrastructure, and providing access to high-speed internet. Uh, that's why I was very concerned. I know you were not there at the time, but when the president put out his budget, as we looked at the, the cuts uh, in all of those areas. And so wonder if you could speak to, in broad measures, you know, where you see us going on rural development, and do you think we need more resources in rural development or less? Thank you, Ranking Member Stabenow, for raising that important concern. I would simply respond that um, I understand that rural is different, um, that no two rural communities are the same, and while they may fa face similar challenges, they may differ need different resources to address that challenge. Um, I'm committed to serving the needs of rural America and to being a partner in rural prosperity. I'm committed to working with you and the members of this committee um, to meet the needs of your rural constituents. And lastly, I'm committed to making effective and efficient use of the resources that Congress provides to meet those needs. Thank you very much. Um, uh, look forward to working with you on that as well. And um, uh, I would just say from our side, concern 
uh, on um, actually bipartisan concern about making sure we're not cutting back on significant things like rural water infrastructure or s small business and so on. And so I uh, look forward to working with you on that. I'd like to talk about broadband, which is a, a passion of mine. And Mr. McLean, you were talking about that being a passion of yours and your agencies as well. Um, when we think about how we move forward, quality of life in small towns, where it, whether it's you know the small businesses I've talked to that want to uh, sell their product around the world and still be in northern Michigan looking at the Great Lakes and the beautiful quality of life that we have, or whether it's our hospitals that want to be able to connect and, and provide the highest quality medical care, or, or uh, whether it's schools and so on and so on. We, we know that this is the piece, at least I believe it's the piece, and I'd like you to speak to this and would welcome each of the panelists to speak about the priority right now of making sure that we are uh, connecting and not leaving rural America behind right now as technology is moving so fast. So uh, I'd like to know uh, your comments further about uh, rural broadband, high-speed internet, and whether or not you'll commit to using every tool at your disposal to expand high-speed internet to small towns and rural communities in Michigan as well as all across the country. Mr. McLean. Uh, by any means necessary approach uh, in the rural utility service using every tool that we do have available to us. Uh, my colleague uh, Keith Adams, uh, who heads the telecom program, works with other federal agencies uh, to coordinate our efforts. Um, in our electric program, we're seeing rural electric cooperatives deploy smart grid technologies using uh, fiber assets, which then can be leveraged um, in partnership with uh, tel local telcos or the co-ops themselves to be able to uh, provide consumer-based broadband services. Uh, we are seeing some amazing projects come before our loan committee where we have reliable re revenues and reliable levels of universal service support where we're seeing fiber to the home. Uh, we just recently approved a, a batch of uh, uh, loans in South Dakota that are, are some of the more remote areas that are bringing fiber to the home technology. So it is possible to be able to do this. But there are segments of the rural market that uh, the story is still being written as to what levels of support will be available. Uh, there's a major proceeding at the Federal Communications Commission to address those rural areas of large telecom providers uh, that need levels of support, and we are watching uh, very, very closely and, where appropriate, providing um, advice uh, on, on how those new support mechanisms will uh, reveal themselves and um, inspire investors, uh, rural electric cooperatives, local telco cooperatives, small town telecom companies, um, and new providers to be able to, to, be able to um, invest in broadband services in those underserved areas. Thank you. I know my time is up, but if there is, uh, would anyone else like to speak from your perspective? Uh, Ms. Hazlitt. Thank you, Ranking Member Stabenow. I would add, um, just uh, stepping out from the program side for a second, I would just raise the opportunity for collaboration here. I mentioned the, the Agriculture and Rural Prosperity Task Force that Secretary Purdue is leading. I think a lot of this from his perspective, also comes down to leadership and just needing to see the different federal agencies that play a role in this important issue working together. I know that he and um, Chairman Pai are in close contact and looking at how our policies can be driving towards um, that common goal. And I, I would just say, I think this is the issue of the moment. Uh, it, at one point, it was collecting, it was connecting the farmhouse at the end of the road with a phone and with electricity and now it is high-speed internet, and if we don't fix that, we're not gonna see the quality of life that we want in our rural communities. Thank you. Senator Bozeman. Well, it's interesting. This, this really, I, I just echo uh, what the ranking member just said. This is so, so very important. I think in Arkansas, 84%, we're not doing as well as Kansas, evidently. So I need to visit with the chairman about that. Uh, but 84%, you know, uh, lack access to quality broadband, which is 30%, uh, uh, you know, higher than the national average. So 
it is something that really is very, very important. I guess the question I'd have, Ms. Hazlitt and, and uh, Mr. McLean, is, is we're getting ready to write the farm bill. You know, what policies do we need to change? What do we need to do differently uh, to make it such that it's easier, you know, to get these things done? Thank you, Senator Bozeman, for that question, and thank you for your leadership on this issue. As we look at the importance of broadband infrastructure and um, the, the, the tool, the lifeline it is for quality of life and economic prosperity, um, we're really looking at this at USDA from three different pieces. Um, I mentioned looking at the different agencies that were working on this topic at the federal level and making sure there's better uh, collaboration there. I'm also looking at how to increase innovation in the deployment of this technology. And then the third piece is what you're touching on. What are those internal processes and programs that we have at USDA and how can we make our tools easier to use, easier to apply for? Um, we look forward to working with the committee um, in the coming months as you're writing this bill um, to offer specific improvements to the Farm Bill broadband programs. bringing revenues up and stable, um, whether it is through the uh, customer base or um, state and federal universal service support mechanisms, and bringing costs down. And one of the ways that we can help here in, in rural utility service bring costs down is by, by providing uh, affordable finance and long-term finance uh, to those that do invest. Uh, and then looking for opportunities for partnership and leveraging. If we can find multiple uses for the same infrastructure, uh, it brings the cost down for all of those users. So we're seeing synergies between smart grid and broadband. We're seeing synergies between public safety and broadband deployment. Uh, when rural providers deploy broadband, we're also seeing wireless providers take advantage of that capacity um, along the highway. So we're, it's, it's finding multiple uses for the same infrastructure to bring the cost of the infrastructure down and having a reliable source of financing and uh, revenues for those um, who are actually putting, those investors who are putting their dollars at stake. Good, very good. Well, I know that, uh, I know you all are committed. I know the Secretary, Secretary Perdue is, is committed to uh, uh, and understands the importance of this. And, and uh, as you're hearing from the committee, you know, it's something that's on our mind, the mind of our constituents. Uh, you simply can't go forward uh, in this day and age that we live without having that ability. I'd like to switch gears a little bit. Ms. Hazlitt, as you know, RUS's water and wastewater loans and grants are very important to rural America, including rural Arkansas. Earlier this year in the Water Fisheries and Wildlife EPW subcommittee hearing that I chaired, one of my constituents testified about his struggles with a lack of running water. Uh, however, with the, the assistance of a USDA grant, they were able to drill wells to bring fresh, reliable drinking water to their home and the homes of their neighbors. As we look to write legislation to address our nation's crumbling infrastructure and write the next farm bill, these two aren't mutually exclusive. Can you or uh, Mr. McLean talk about USDA's water and wastewater programs and what more can be done to ensure that rural America has access to safe, reliable water? Thank you for um, Senator Bozeman for raising this important issue. Um, I understand that the water resources in rural communities are great. Um, I've seen it in my own travels. Um, we will certainly uh, steward the resources that you provide to meet these challenges. Um, if you provide funding, we will build infrastructure um, with the dollars that are provided. Um, certainly, there's always opportunity for improvement in our programs, and I would allow um, Administrator McLean to elaborate on some specific opportunities that we might have to make this program even stronger. It's interesting. This gentleman that I referenced was right outside of Fayetteville, which you know very, very well. I do. Yes, sir. Yes, well, thank you very much. And um, uh, this year alone, um, the Rural Utilities Service has um, obligated about $35 million of investments in rural water in the state of Arkansas. 
and we're very, very proud of that. Uh, we you have that very, very, very innovative um, municipalities that are uh, bringing uh, water and sewer systems to their communities. But it's hard. It's tough. Um, our, uh, our loan and grant programs are uh, focused on communities of 10,000 or less. Uh, and we have to mix that loan and grant combination in order to try to target the grant dollars to those areas that are needed the most. And uh, there is always more demand for resources than we have available. And we just, we work really hard to be able to um, spend down to the very last penny um, in order to invest those resources wisely. Okay. Thank you and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Leahy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I thank the panelists. I mentioned we've got a Judiciary Committee meeting going on two doors away, and I try to be at both of them, but I, I am always concerned on rural development matters. One of the reasons I've stayed in this committee all these years, and uh, coming from as rural a state as you're going to find. We have, fortunately, the opioid epidemic is devastating our communities, including rural areas in Vermont. Senator Roberts and Senator Donnelly, to their credit, have introduced a bill requiring USDA to make a priority of community facility direct loans and grants for substance abuse disorder treatment services, including telemedicine facilities and so on. Um, and I think we should make a priority of that. But I think we also have to find new resources to combat it. We should find a way in the Farm Bill to increase funding for community facilities to combat opioid addiction. So, Ms. Hazlett, I know you're looking at this very closely, and I ask you this. Will you support efforts only to make a priority of grants that will combat the opioid epidemic, but increase our investment in community facilities, direct loans and grants, to continue serving communities as loans and grants do now. <clears throat> and what can the department do to strengthen and improve rural development programs to help those who are struggling with opioid? I mean, it's, it's become, in some places, as you know, uh, an epidemic, and this is not a a Democratic or Republican issue is something that I think it's fair to say every single senator on, on this panel uh, worries about. Thank you, Senator Leahy, for raising this important issue, and thank you for your leadership. Um, Secretary Purdue recently held a listening session um, in New Hampshire where he heard from various stakeholders about this crisis, and we had an opportunity to see some of the things that are working in the Northeast very well to address this issue. Um, I think, you know, USDA's role in this topic, we certainly have um, that the immediate uh, short-term um, programs for communities to access as they are helping um, build that immediate response. Our communities to facilities program is certainly one of them. We also have the distance learning program um, as well as some prevention grant resources. I think a, another significant opportunity for USDA really is that longer horizon, however, where we are well positioned to be a strong partner in addressing some of the root challenges that are often at the heart of this issue. But so you're, going to, you're going to need more money in these programs to do that, is that correct? There certainly resources will be needed. And are you going to push for those resources? You have my commitment to steward whatever resources are provided. Are you going to push for us providing those resources? You have I'm, wearing, I'm wearing my hat as the Vice Chairman of the Appropriations Committee now. You have my commitment to steward the resources that are provided. Well, I, I would say to steward them, you're going to have to get them. And I, I realize the restraints, but you know, I've talked with Secretary Purdue about this too. But you got to ask for the money, and you got to push for the money. Uh, Senator, I'm sure that you and I will receive a, a call from Ann, if not the Secretary, for adequate funding on this most important topic. 
and we're united in that effort. Yeah, this is this is not a Republican or Democratic thing. We're we're all concerned. Uh, we also have our forest economy. You know, Vermont depends on a 1.4 billion dollar forest based economy every year, which is a lot, a lot of money in a small state like ours. We've got some really nice forests, uh, healthy. But in Vermont, across the uh, New England, we're struggling with the recent loss of important markets for low-grade wood due to the closure of several pulp and biomass mills. Uh, we, we need a, a market, of course, for high-grade wood. We see that in construction and furniture and everything else. We also need low-grade. We have to have both if we're going to really manage our forests. And if you have non-existent or poor forest management, we all know what the fires can occur. So can rural development and our existing farm bill help to expand forest products market and support uh, a strong forest products industry? I mean, we, we talk about normal, a lot of crops that we're all used to, but forests are part of that, is it not? Are they not? Thank you, Senator Leahy, for um, raising an important sector of the Northeast economy. Um, I had an opportunity uh, to travel with Secretary Purdue to the Northeast earlier this month and certainly saw firsthand the importance of this industry in the, re in, in the region. Um, I am committed to preserving and enhancing the diverse rural economy through rural development's many programs. I will let Acting Administrator Mr. Parker um, elaborate on some of the business tools that might be there to, to help that sector. Well, I, and my, my last question by my Mr. Chairman, I, I was disappointed when I saw that the President's budget proposed to eliminate rural housing service grant programs, including Section 502, 504, and 515. These um, these provide affordable housing. And uh, essential in rural America. Will you, uh, I'm asking Ms. Hayes that you and Mr. Davis, will you work with the secretary and this committee? Because we all have rural areas that are affected to find out how we can create a sustainable housing strategy for a rural America that's sustainable at both affordability and access. Thanks, Pat. Thank you, Senator Leahy. Um, appreciate the importance of that issue in rural communities, and uh, we'll work with you to ensure innovation and that we leverage the resources provided. Mr. Davis? Mr. Davis, you work with us, too? Absolutely, sir. Yeah, I kind of expected the answer. I just wanted to hear it. Well, no, we would be most uh, interested in working with you. Um, it is an important segment of the rural, uh, of rural America, of the rural economy, and important to uh, the success of rural America. So, absolutely. Thank you. I noted that Mr. Davis nodded his head up and down vigorously. <laughs> Sir, we see in the record it was a vigorous. Day. That's correct. Senator Daines. Chairman Roberts and Ranking Member Stabenow, thanks for holding this hearing. You know, I spent decades in the private sector uh, before entering public service. In fact, got to be part of building a world-class cloud computing company in my hometown of Bozeman, Montana. I certainly know the impact that technology has in our communities <coughs> and how access to broadband can break down geographical barriers, as we say back home. Uh, Technology has removed geography as a constraint. With connectivity, a family in rural Montana can start up their own small businesses and have access to global markets. When Oracle acquired our company several years ago, as they were building out their global cloud computing structure, think about this. They have three cloud command centers around the world for their 365, 24 by 7 cloud operations for the seventh largest cloud computing company in the world, which is now Oracle. They have three cloud command centers. For Europe, Middle East, Africa, it's London. For Asia Pacific, it's Bangalore. For the Americas, it's Bozeman, Montana. So it demonstrates the fact we're not talking about just backwaters players now. We're, you know, and these, this is MBA level, uh, first string companies that uh, in, in the technology sector. 
But this is going to be impossible to keep moving forward unless we close this rural-urban gap. The gap between high speeds that urban residents have access to and the lack of any speeds that rural residents have. I always find it interesting sometimes to hear about that we got to get from 4G to 5G in some of these areas. There's places in Montana that haven't even found the alphabet yet. We're not talking about G. It's one of the reasons I'm hosting a, a tech summit, in fact, a Montana tech summit in Missoula in early October. We're going to bring industry and government leaders together in, uh, to talk about how technology can continue to help rural communities grow. Additionally, programs like the Farm Bill Broadband Loans and Community Connect Grants are important to rural areas across the country. However, they only work when they are applied correctly, efficiently in communities that truly have need. Administrator McLean, RUS broadband loans and grants have helped many rural communities in the United States. However, the impact of some programs like the Community Connect Grant Initiative have been limited in my home state of Montana. For example, Montana has not yet received a Community Connect Grant during the program's 15-year tenure. Could you help explain the criteria for this in similar grants and loans and how Montana communities and businesses can be better uh, utilizers of this important program? Sure, thank you. Um, I'd be delighted to. First of all, Montana does uh, has some of the finest uh, rural telecom companies um, in America, in, including Lincoln Telephone, who recently secured an RUS uh, uh, loan in uh, telecom infrastructure. And so we're really proud of that partnership. The challenge in the uh, Community Connect program is it is uh, small in number of dollars and highly, highly competitive. Uh, the focus on our grant programs in general, whether it's in uh, telecommunications, electric, or water, are to focus uh, the limited grant dollars on those areas that have the highest need. So the scoring criteria will favor the most remote, the most poor, the most underserved. Community Connect is focused on communities that have zero broadband, um, no, no broadband availability at all. And we are able to do right around 10 or so grants a year based on the uh, dollars that are appropriated. Some years it's been significantly less. Uh, a couple of years we've been able to uh, uh, shake out the cushions and get, get a few uh, uh, extra dollars and make it a little bit more. But it's, it's been typically right around $10 million and we can do about 10 grants and they're just very, very, very competitive. Uh, we're delighted to work with uh, communities and we do webinars and would be happy to help advise uh, community groups on how to apply and uh, would be look forward to working with you and your staff to um, find ways to um, improve the success rate. Th th thank you. I want to uh, shift gears just for a moment in the time I have left to talk about tribal broadband issues. Montana's home to 12 federally recognized tribes and the state recognized Little Shell. We know that access to broadband opens up new possibilities, opportunities truly for our tribal communities. Unfortunately, according to the FCC's 2016 fixed broadband report, 65% of the population on tribal lands lack access to fixed telecommunication services, 65%. Many small companies in Montana have stepped up to bring wireless and broadband access. We're grateful for that, including Nemont Wireless and Triangle Communications. But uh, I think the federal government does play a role in this. Question to, to Administrator McLean, what is RUS doing to expand access to tribal communities? Uh, thank you very much. Um, tribal communities are a key focus of our outreach. Um, we are a frequent contact with uh, tribal organizations and working with the FCC and the NTIA to be able to um, provide outreach and uh, explain how our programs work. Uh, one of the challenges that we do face in tribal communities are frankly our rights of way uh, where the ownership of land is uh, often a checkerboard. Um, some land is uh, privately held, some land is held in trust, and some land is held by uh, uh, families that are dispersed, maybe not even aware of their ownership of the land. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I actually uh, worked on a, um, there was a major uh, project in Montana uh, that ran right up against that problem. And uh, it was not able to be completed because there was 
um, uh, inability to be able to uh, get consensus on how the rights of way would be managed. Yeah, thank you. I know I'm out of time here. We are good at playing checkers in Montana with the nature yeah. of land ownership exactly. for sure. So anyway, thanks for the, for the comments. Thank you. Senator Donnelly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I would like to thank uh, Ann Hazlett. Thank you so much for your service. Um, it's always great to see a fellow Hoosier here in the committee. Before we get into the questions, I want to thank you for your service to the people of Indiana and to the country. I'm sure you'll make all of us proud in your new position at USDA. Um, I want to ask you also about an issue that I know is dear to your heart and mine and to many Hoosiers and to all of us. Um, I know you're aware of the difficulties that many of our communities are having when responding to the challenges of addiction. I've been working with a number of members on the committee and trying to ensure that USDA has the resources it needs to help our rural communities respond more effectively. Um, I've been fortunate to introduce a pair of bills with Chairman Roberts and Senator Strange and I want to thank them both for their partnership to help provide rural communities with what's needed. Opioids and substance abuse impact every community, but accessing treatment is even more of a challenge in some of our rural areas, as you know, across our state too. Can you discuss how USDA's community facilities and telemedicine programs will help rural families and rural communities address the crisis? Thank you, Senator Donnelly, for raising this important issue and for your leadership on it. Um, the, both of the programs that you highlight are certainly um, being used uh, well right now to address um, both uh, providing treatment facilities in communities as well as um, using innovation through telemedicine to access those services that might not be located in the immediate town. Um, certainly, Mr. Davis can go into specific numbers that we have um, with those programs. I think one of the things that I'd like to circle back to that I'm excited about, um, mentioned in my beginning remarks, the Innovation Center that Secretary Perdue intends to create. I think this is a good example of an issue that for communities that are finding themselves in the crosshair for the first time and want to know what has worked well in other places, whether it's through um, treatment resources or um, uh, some of the other ways that a rural community might um, have a unique asset that can be leveraged to address this challenge. Um, that's a great example of where best practices are something that the Innovation Center can then disseminate in so that communities do not feel alone. Um, Ms. Hazlett, also, I'm sure we both agree that substance abuse and addiction education and prevention programs are really critical to ensure not only treating the symptoms, but also working to prevent it from occurring in the first place. A program you're aware of, Purdue Extension, um, which has great reach into our rural communities around the state. They offer family substance abuse prevention programs like Strengthening Families Program, which has been shown to lower levels of substance abuse in younger people. Um, can you discuss how important for rural communities programs like these are for their families? Absolutely. I've actually had an opportunity to see that program firsthand on the ground in Scott County, Indiana. And I think one of the great strengths of a program like that is that it is looking at some of the underlying causes that lead um, for many of these situations, um, lead families into many of these situations. Um, when we look at those types of programs, I think we're not just changing that immediate situation, but we're potentially changing a generation, and we're having a broader community conversation about factors that need to be addressed to have prosperity and quality of life in these areas, things like public transportation, food security, um, literacy rates. Um, it, it, op it's, it becomes a catalyst for a broader conversation that will result in stronger communities and a stronger rural America for the future. Thank you, Ms. Hazlett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Casey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I wanted to uh, start with a question for uh, Ms. Hazlitt uh, on a Pennsylvania initiative that's been been replicated in other states. But I want to make two <coughs> brief comments. First, um, the broadband focus <coughs> of this hearing and the, um, I think, bipartisan concern about that is, is uh, significant. And I think the problem is urgent. I, Spent a lot of time in August going to uh, counties in our state that are substantially rural. We've got 67 counties, but 48 are rural counties. And I was in counties where 
50 percent, uh, Juniata County, 52 percent of, of the folks that live in that county don't have high-speed internet. Um, so, Su Sullivan County, 69 percent, Susquehanna, 66. Counties all across the state that have 40, 50, 60 percent without broadband. So it's a major impediment for small businesses, kids in school, and the like. So we're grateful that there's a, a focus on it. We've got to do a lot more. Secondly, I'm hoping that history repeats itself in the uh, appropriations process where the administration <coughs> um, unfortunately made a, a series of proposals in the budget which would eliminate uh, water and wastewater, the water and wastewater program, eliminating the rural business program, eliminate interest payments to electronic and telecom utilities, eliminate rural economic development program, on and on and on. The appropriators chose to do otherwise. I'm grateful for that. I hope history repeats itself, though, when it comes to the administration's proposal with regard to the Farm Bill, which is to say it's outrageous and obnoxious doesn't get to the heart of it. Uh, cutting the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program by, I think it's $193 billion <coughs> over 10 years. So we're hoping that this committee will be in bipartisan opposition to those kinds of cuts. There are my comments. I wanted to ask you about, though, the Fresh Food Financing Initiative, which is a, a success story from Pennsylvania replicated in a number of states around the country. Pennsylvania's program created over 5,000 jobs, or created or retained, I should say, $190 million of investment just from that one initiative by putting down just $30 million. So put down 30, get 190 in investment. Um, it's helped in food deserts, and it's also a program where there's a substantial personal investment uh, up front, um, but it, it's, it's worked out well in a lot of states. My question is, how do you see that? Um, how do you see that initiative in the Department of Agriculture going forward? Because it's it's been battle tested or road tested, and I want to get your sense of it. Thank you, Senator Casey, uh, for raising an important issue. Food uh, insecurity and hunger in rural communities um, is certainly a piece of quality of life as well as economic um, opportunity and prosperity. Um, when we look at the Healthy Food Financing Initiative, I think you see an exciting model um, of a public-private partnership, um, not only a public-private partnership, but an innovative way um, in looking at solving a longstanding challenge in many communities. And rural America is not, certainly not immune from that. Um, we're looking forward to working with the national fund manager um, that has been designated for this program um, as they move forward with implementation, um, really as an opportunity to learn from their experience and to leverage some of the relationships that they have um, working in this sector to enhance um, further investments in this area, um, particularly in low-income rural communities. I hope as we go forward, if there are things that um, <coughs> or priorities or um, funding or otherwise that the committee can help with, I hope you alert us to that. Um, just had one more question for you, and I know you can probably amplify this in writing, but the value added producer grant is a valuable resource to assist small businesses and new and beginning veteran farmers with the development and marketing of new products to increase income in our state. These grants have been awarded to uh, uh, to market uh, custom beef processing, create processed milk products, and finish uh, and bottled wines. Can you elaborate more on the program and how this program can be expanded to reach new audiences? Thank you. Uh, this program really uh, touches everything from jam to lotion to everything in between. Um, it has really opened doors to new business opportunities for a broad range of agriculture producers, um, allowing them to bring new products to market. As Congress you know, looks to improve uh, the program in the next Farm Bill, we'd be pleased to work with the committee um, for any thoughts you have about changes to make to improve its effectiveness. Great. Thanks very much. Thank you, Mr. Sure. Chairman. <coughs> A vote has been called uh, in the interest of uh, bipartisanship, which is a very strong uh, element of this committee. I am now yielding the gavel to the distinguished senator from Michigan 
on a temporary basis. <laughs> I don't know, Mr. Chairman. I may not give it back. <laughs> There's always that worry. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Right, while you me. vote, and then when you come back, I'll go do the same. So uh, thank you very much. I think next up we have Senator Bennett. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for your service, all of you. I want to express my gratitude to the Secretary of Agriculture, Secretary Purdue, for hosting a meeting earlier this week with senators that are concerned about the fire borrowing issue, which I know is not the topic of this uh, hearing. But I just want to put, say to my colleagues, um, this is something that uh, uh, solving this is long overdue. There's strong bipartisan support. The, the, the Secretary of Agriculture, much to his credit, is following up on commitments that he made during the confirmation process, and I hope that we will come together and finally solve this issue for, uh, for our states, not just our western states, but states all over the country. Um, Ms. Hazlitt, I just wanted to ask you a, actually a somewhat related question. I've been around Colorado um, all this year, as I am every year, from La Hunta to Alamosa and every where around the state, it is clear that rural communities, uh, as they are in America, continue to struggle with this uh, challenging uh, commodity environment, farm incomes decreasing, um, but also in our part of the world with prolonged drought and limited access to affordable land and water. At the same time, scientists estimate that new technologies could sequester 30 to 50 percent of carbon emissions across the economy while enhancing soil health and farm resilience, meaning there is additional value in our farmland that is not being taken into account. I was pleased to hear Mr. Sensky last week discuss his commitment to prioritize climate change in the interest of future generations. I agree with his asses assessment uh, of that as well, and I think Colorado's producers do as well. We have a unique opportunity to use USDA programs to improve the livelihoods of, next, of the next generation through addressing climate change and diversifying economic opportunities for farmers and ranchers. So I wanted to ask you, Ms. Hazlitt, whether you're willing to work with the committee and our team to identify opportunities to decrease the amount of carbon pollution in our atmosphere while also enhancing farm incomes. Thank you, Senator Bennett, for raising um, this issue. Uh, you know, at USDA, uh, for many years, our motto has been committed to the future of rural communities. Um, our programs have adapted and adjusted to issues that have been important at the time, and that will not change. Thank you. I'm glad to hear that. And I know in some ways we're on the cutting edge here, but it is so important for us to plan for the future, to be resilient for the future, and where there is the possibility of adding new streams of income to uh, our farmers and ranchers' operations. I think it's critical for us to consider what those look like. So is there anybody else who'd like to say anything about that? Okay. I wanted to talk about water infrastructure as well. Um, and, and let me also say, uh, Madam Chair, that um, I think the, the concern about broadband is one that everybody on this committee shares and our communities desperately share. When, when we say that one community can have broadband and another community can't have broadband, it is tantamount to saying, one group of students can have textbooks this year and another group of students cannot have textbooks this year. It is entirely unacceptable from the standpoint of rural children in my state and I know in yours as well. So we've got to stay focused on it. I also just wanted to talk a little bit about water infrastructure. I was in Cuba meeting with the Minister of Agriculture who pointed out to me that uh, they don't have a tractor in Cuba that is um, newer than 50 years old. And that seemed like a great opportunity for us. Uh, but then I left and I thought to myself, well, we don't have water infrastructure that's less than 50 years old in a lot of parts of rural America and including in Colorado. The USDA's Rural Utility Service has a significant backlog, as has been discussed, of applications for loans and grants to repair and rehabilitate rural water infrastructure. Last year in Colorado, this program provided 13 loans and six grants, all to communities of fewer than 5,000 people. Yet there's nearly a $30 million backlog in Colorado alone. And despite this, the President's budget proposal zeroed out the water infrastructure program. And Mr. McLean, I'd like to ask you what you view as the biggest hurdle to reducing this backlog um, uh, in the program. 
Well, we, uh, we execute the, uh, the laws that uh, Congress passes yeah. and the appropriations that Congress provides, and uh, to our greatest uh, uh, extent possible, um, we try to focus our resources where, uh, where they can be the most helpful. Uh, we typically alloc allocate uh, water uh, funding to our state offices of rural development, um, and then at the end of the year, uh, if individual states don't use those dollars, we pool them on the federal level and then target them towards high priority projects. But at any given time, I do have projects that are awaiting funding. And um, the uh, ingenuity and, and uh, creativity of, of our staff in the rural water and uh, sewer authorities across the country um, take those resources and leverage them, and uh, we look for every opportunity to be able to um, stretch those dollars. So would you say the backlog is that there's not enough money? Right. The, the, back, well, the backlog is uh, projects awaiting funding. Right. Yes. So this is another place where we are failing to invest, and I think we have to find a way, because we have to recognize there are budget constraints, we have to find a way to um, have a more creative approach to financing projects as well. But I think the idea that they would zero out this particular part in the budget is just entirely unacceptable. I, I would say to Democrats and Republicans on this panel, and we're going to have to figure out a different solution. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I thank, I thank my colleagues. Thank you very much, and I would underscore uh, your comments as well, Senator Bennett. Senator Van Hollen, welcome, and your turn. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank all of you for your uh, testimony. I just want to pick up on the broadband deployment uh, point. I heard as Senator Bennett uh, was talking, or I saw, uh, you nodding your head saying that broadband deployment was essential to economic development in rural areas. Do you all agree with that? Absolutely. All right. And would you all agree that we've still got a lot of work to do to make sure that we have adequate deployment to meet the economic needs of rural America? Yes, sir. So I want to raise with you uh, the issue that's pending right now before the FCC. They have a 706 inquiry. Are you familiar with that yes, sir, I am. inquiry? Uh, because I've been hearing a lot about this uh, from rural parts of my state. And the gist of that inquiry is whether or not, for the purposes of determining whether we have adequate broadband deployment in rural areas, or any area, we can say that uh, wireless deployment is good enough and that we don't also have to look at the deployment of fixed broadband. Are you familiar with that? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association is one of many that have filed uh, comments uh, in that case. Uh, and on page two of their filing, they just state flat out, quote, the commission, meaning the FCC, should continue to assess fixed and mobile broadband separately in determining whether advanced communications capabilities are being deployed to all Americans in a reasonable and timely fashion. Do you agree with that statement? Yeah. You do. So my question now is whether or not the Department of Agriculture has weighed in or commented as well uh, before the FCC with respect to uh, the proposal that's uh, pending the um, 706 inquiry. So I will uh, defer to uh, Ms. Hazlett, who uh, to be able to answer on. Thank you, Senator Van Hollen. I'm not aware of this issue, but we'll certainly be happy to follow up today. Uh, Sec Secretary Purdue has placed a top priority on broadband deployment and connectivity in America, and we'll be happy to get you that information. Well, that, let me, uh, okay. I, Senator, um, yeah. I, I, let me, if I may, uh, address that uh, point. The, um, we have not filed um, as a petitioner with the FCC. We have an ongoing dialogue with the FCC. And uh, the Secretary of Agriculture um, is uh, chairing the um, Agriculture and Rural Prosperity Task Force, which the chairman of the FCC is a uh, member. Um, and uh, there, I, I, I can report that um, 
broadband is a key focus of that effort. And that dialogue, um, although not proceeding as a formal petition, um, is ongoing between the uh, executive branch agencies. Okay, well, I would, I would just um, say if, if the sec and I, I took the secretary to his word as well that he's engaged in these issues, but if he's not fully aware and engaged with what's happening at the FCC, the grants that are provided by the Department of Ag Ag you know, Agriculture, the rural telecommunication loans and the rural broadband loans and grants, they're all very important. But what's happening in the FCC could have a even bigger impact on the deployment of broadband in rural areas. And uh, that is why you've got the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association and all others weighing in. So I'm going to ask you uh, to get ask you whether or not the Department of Agriculture will weigh in um, with the FCC and let them know that the position of the Department of Agriculture is to not count wireless deployment as a total substitute for fixed deployment. There are huge differences between the two in terms of the capabilities uh, and the costs. So I, I know you can't answer that today, but I'm, I would like the Department of Agriculture to get back to us, to get back to me, uh, and let me know if you're willing to weigh in formally on this issue, because everyone says, and, and I believe you, that you care about broadband deployment. This action before the SEC is going to have a really big impact on the future of broadband deployment in rural areas. Thank you. Thank you very much for those important questions. And Senator Grassley. Uh, uh, Senator Stabenow, I'm waiting for the second panel to ask questions. All so right. Don't have very it. good. Well, I think at this moment, then, we will uh, thank each of you for being with us on the first panel and move to the second panel. We'd ask folks to come up, and we will uh, proceed. And... Uh, As we switch, uh, I'm going to recess for just a moment uh, it, so that I can vote before the time runs out. Senator uh, Roberts, Chairman Roberts, will be back in just a moment. Thank you. No, thank you. I call the committee back to order. Uh, thanks to the first panel, and uh, we appreciate your testimony. I'd like now to welcome our second panel of witnesses before the committee. First, we have Ms. Alida Botts. Ms. Botts is the Executive Director of the Kentucky Center for Agriculture and Rural Development, a position to which she was named in 2013. She has over 15 years of experience working on agriculture and rural development policy issues and helping individuals in our rural areas understand issues relating to policy and financing. It could be of help to individual senators, I would imagine. Before returning to Kentucky to work for KCARD, Alita spent almost 10 years working on agriculture and other issues at the federal level as a policy staffer in the U.S. House of Representatives. She grew up on a farm in Menifee County, Kentucky, received her B.S. and M.S. in agriculture economics from the University of Kentucky. She currently lives on a small farm in Menifee County with her husband and two children. Welcome to you, ma'am. Uh, we look forward to your testimony. Second witness is Mr. Elmer Ronnebaum. Uh, General Manager, Kansas World Water Association and Seneca, Kansas, America. Our, he is um, the General Manager of the Kansas World uh, Water Association. Ms. Rodemann's career has spanned five decades and has been focused on working to ensure all of Kansas's rural communities have access to safe and affordable water. First as a Program Director and then as General Manager of the Kansas World Water Association, Elmer has been critical to the development and facilitation of many training venues for public water systems. Furthermore, under, under his leadership, the Kansas World Water Association has developed a statewide water GPS mapping program and the popular self-help program called CANSTEP, which has been responsible for the construction of, ne of nearly 90 community facilities uh, using local volunteer uh, labor services. He and his wife, Kathleen, hail from Baileyville, Kansas. Elmer, I'm glad you're here to uh, uh, join us today. Our next witness is Mr. Christopher Stevens. Mr. Stevens is president and CEO of uh, 
Coweta, I think I'm doing that right. Uh, Fayette Electric Membership uh, Corporation headquartered in Palmetto, Georgia. And Mr. Stevens graduated from Newman High School in 1987 and attended the Georgia Institute of Technology where he graduated with a Bachelor of Electrical Engineering degree back in 91 and earned his professional engineering uh, certification in 1998. Once out of college, he worked as a design engineer for Ritz Instrument Transformers in Waynesboro, Georgia, and then utility consultants in Atlanta before becoming supervisor of engineering at Coweta Fayette EMC in 1996. Mr. Stevens is a native of Newman, Georgia, where he lives with Lori, his wife, and their two children. We look forward to your testimony, sir. Senator Thune has already given a marvelous introduction to you, uh, uh, Denny, and so uh, we'll let that stand for the record, but uh, uh, welcome, and we really appreciate your coming, and we look forward to your testimony. Our next witness is Mr. Brent Shanks, who is the director of uh, the NSF Engineering Research Center for Biorenewable Chemicals from Iowa State University, home of the Fighting Cyclones in Ames, Iowa. I now turn to Senator Grasley for this introduction. Uh, it, it is my honor, and I've had a chance to just have a short conversation with Dr. Shanks. Uh, he's the Mike and Gene Stephenson Chair of Chemical and Biological Engineering at Iowa State University. Dr. Shanks is the director of the National Science Foundation Engineering Research Center for Biorenewable Chemicals and an Anson Marston uh, Distinguished Professor in Engineering. He has been on the faculty of Iowa State since 1999, where he has focused on converting biomass feedstocks into chemicals and fuels. Uh, we welcome you, Dr. Shanks. I was going to turn to the ranking member to introduce our final witness, but again, in the spirit of bipartisanship, I'm delighted to introduce you, sir. Our last witness is Mr. Mark Olenek. Mr. Olenek is Chief Executive Officer of the Harvest Energy Solutions and one of its co-founders. Mark is responsible for developing harvest operating strategies and all external advisor relationships. He holds a BBA degree from Michigan State University obviously why the ranking member wanted to introduce you with the green and white. The distinguished ranking member had me uh, decorated in uh, green and white when we had our, our hearing up there. So just want you to know that. This is a, when you come to Kansas, you can wear purple. And an MBA from the University of Michigan. Uh, thank you for joining us today, Mr. Olenek. Uh, Mr. Botts, if you could start off uh, with your testimony. Ms. Botts, pardon me. Thank you. Chairman Roberts, Ranking Member Stabenow, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify here today on rural development issues, and thank you for having this hearing. The programs being discussed today touch every person living in rural America. The Kentucky Center for Agriculture and Rural Development, known as KCARD, has provided technical assistance services for agriculture producers, organizations, co-ops, and businesses for 16 years in the Commonwealth of Kentucky. Through this work, we see firsthand the conditions facing ag producers as they start new businesses, seek to add value to their commodities to capture more of that food dollar, and face significant challenges to their bottom line. In Kentucky, this work means that we help businesses developed by ag producers at all stages of development. This work would not be possible without the support of the Federal Rural Cooperative Development Grant Program. This program, authorized in the Farm Bill, provides support for KCARD to be the resource for the development of co-ops in Kentucky. By forming cooperatives, farmers are able to achieve gains that would be out of reach if they were facing the market alone. In Kentucky, in just the past few years, KCARD has worked with an organic feed mill co-op, a small sweet potato co-op, a grain elevator co-op, and multiple farmers markets. And right now, we are working with a group of producers seeking to purchase a portion of a large agribusiness that serves them, creating continuity for that agribusiness and its owners, and creating a way for the producers to gain a stake in a business directly serving them. The RCDG program has delivered results nationwide. As centers like KCARD have developed over 300 co-ops and 350 non-co-op businesses and created or saved over 10,000 jobs in just a documented eight-year time span, it deserves to be reauthorized in the Farm Bill and funded at the highest possible level in annual appropriation bills. 
Through the combined resources of RCDG and the Kentucky Ag Development Fund, KCARD addresses complicated ag business situations every day. Through KCARD's work with businesses, we see at the ground level their experiences with various federal grant and loan programs. We have worked with the vast majority of value-added producer grant recipients in Kentucky in the past five years, so we have seen the applications, the record-keeping required, and the paperwork challenges. This program is important because the funds go to producers and producer groups themselves to advance the goal of producers securing a greater percentage of that food dollar. The program is a good investment for the federal government. It accomplishes this through submission of business plans, financial projections, estimates of customer growth, and pricing calculations. I've elaborated in my written testimony on ways to improve the program, but just to quickly summarize, the business plans are important. We should consider a rolling application process for planning grants. We need to maintain producer eligibility restrictions, and we need to recognize that rural development is uniquely suited to run this program due to the assets they have on the ground. RCDG and VAPG are just two rural development programs critically important to fostering job creation, and RCDG is critical to VAPG success, providing the support that VAPG eligible businesses need to launch and thrive. Rural development programs respond to a need driven by the notion that economies of scale are harder to achieve in rural areas, that services are harder to provide because of that, and that people living in these rural areas deserve the same access to services and opportunity as those living in metro areas. KCARD staff works with farmers and rural businesses every day to help them survive and thrive. I live in a rural area on a rural water system. I use rural broadband provided by a rural telecom co-op to do my work. I buy my electricity from a rural co-op, and I can say unequivocally that these programs are critical to the health of our rural areas. If we want our rural areas to be strong, we have to support all of these programs working together to deliver needed infrastructure, foster job creation, and provide a high quality of life for our rural citizens. Thank you. We uh, appreciate your testimony. Uh, Mr. Ronabon. Chairman Roberts and Ranking Member Stabenow, members of the committee, my name is Elmer Ronabon. I am General Manager of the Kansas Rural Water Association, and I appreciate uh, the opportunity to speak to you today. My experience with rural water goes back to the early 1970s when I was elected to a steering committee and then subsequently served for 14 years on the Board of Directors as we formed uh, developed and constructed a large regional water supply in Nemaha and Marshall Counties. It went on to serve some 700 rural residents and farmsteads in the two communities of Centralia and Corning. That first project was funded with a loan only from the then Farmers Home Administration. About 10 years later, we needed to expand the capacity due to the needs of that water system. We obtained a second loan from then Farmers Home Administration, again, another loan only. I'm here today to ask you for your support to continue the funding for that program, which is today known as the Water and the Wastewater Loan Program, uh, operated under USDA Rural Development. The public water supply systems in the United States number some uh, 60,000. I represent the Kansas Rural Water Association, but also the other 44 state associations that make up the National Rural Water Association and their membership of some 31,000 member utilities. 92% of those public water supply systems serve populations less than 10,000, and 80% of the wastewater utilities in the nation, some 16,000, serve populations less than 10,000. In Kansas, there are 786 of the 855 public water so supply systems that serve fewer than 3,000. The issue of affordability of drinking water is a major concern for those public water supply systems across the United States. The Rural Development Program is critical to addressing that effort. The USDA program provides help to citizens to have more affordable rates because of the provision for longer-term financing than the EPA-funded state revolving loan funds or that commercial credit can offer. I tried to put the issue of affordability into some perspective in reviewing the cost that were incurred by a new public wholesale district in Strong City, Cottonwood Falls, and the Little Chase Rural Water District in Kansas, without USDA rural development funding of loans and grants and a small portion from the Community Development Block Grant, the citizens in Strong City, Kansas, would have had their water rates quadruple to 
$25 per thousand, making 5,000 gallons of water cost $167, a 4250 minimum and uh, 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 roughly $25 per thousand for a total of $167 for 5,000 gallons. That is absolutely not affordable in most communities. Strictly relying on commercial credit and the EPA loan and grant loan program, uh, which addresses compliance, the USDA rural, rural development program varies from that because it takes affordability as a primary factor in the, the consideration of those loans. We complement the agency for developing an online program for the application process. RD Apply has helped the borrowers and it certainly has helped the agency. Um, thank you, Chairman Roberts, for the opportunity to comment. I'd be happy to take any questions later. Well, thank you, Elmer. Thank you for your long service in behalf of Kansas. I don't know about Centralia. Centralia used to beat up on the Holton Wildcats all the time. Just didn't think that was right. Strong City has a great rodeo, and uh, obviously you can't afford water at those kind of prices. Excellent example. Thank you so much. Mr. Stevens. Thank you, Chairman Roberts, Ranking Member Stabenow, and members of the committee for inviting me to testify. I'm the President and CEO of Coweta Fed Electric Membership Corporation, a not-for-profit not electric cooperative in Georgia. We provide electricity to nearly 70,000 members, operate over 6,000 miles of line, and employ around 200 people. The Farm Bill is essential to co-ops because it contains tools we use to keep the lights on in rural America generate and distribute electricity from renewable sources, modernize the grid, and promote economic development of the communities we serve. For decades, the Rural Utilities Electric Loan Program has been our foundation, providing low-cost financing to co-ops for installing and maintaining the grid. It's been the most important tool, rural development tool in this country's history. Today, co-ops are adapting to changes in consumer demand, accommodating an evolving generation mix, and protecting against cyber threats. The Farm Bill helps us fund essential projects to make our systems more modern, efficient, and secure. We have enjoyed strong support for robust RUS funding because we're such a good investment for the federal government, providing valuable service to our communities and, rel and reliably paying back our loans. We ask that you help us maintain that support in the Farm Bill. In the 21st century, robust, robust, robust communications infrastructure is just as important to our businesses as our traditional assets like poles, wire, and power plants. My co-op is currently conducting an economic study to determine the feasibility of building out a broadband network. Our main motivation is to take care of internal operational needs to make our system more efficient and secure. However, once this foundation is in place, there are lots, lots of things we can do with it. One option could be facilitating the connection of our members' homes and businesses to broadband internet. Some people in our region don't have access to reliable internet. That puts our consumers, schools, hospitals, and employers at a disadvantage. Another part of modernizing the grid is deploying new energy sources for helping our customers save money by manage, managing their own energy better. Coweta Fed EMC is a founding member of Green Power EMC, which sources renewable energy from low-impact hydro plants, biomass, landfill gas, and solar. At the end of last year, Green Power EMC projects projects were generating 270 megawatts of electricity, enough power to serve over 200,000 homes, and that will nearly double by the year 2020. We also sponsor CEFID efforts to bring solar installations to schools and to help our customers finance money-saving home energy efficiency projects. We urge the committee to reauthorize programs like Rural Energy for America program, and the Rural Energy Savings Program to ensure that electric co-ops can continue to meet the evolving demands of our member owners. In addition to our electrification work, cooperatives play a vital economic, economic development role in the communities we serve. Since 2009, Georgia co-ops have funded around $10 million through the Rural Economic Development Loan and Grant Program, also known as Red Leg. These projects include the renovation of a hospital and construction of a new cattle feed operation to support local agribusiness. We believe the Red Leg Program is a valuable tool in offsetting, in offsetting population flight and job losses in rural America and around the country. We urge the committee to work with us to ensure ample funding for Red Leg throughout the next Farm Bill and beyond. Lastly, allow me to mention an issue of vital importance to the health of electric co-ops in Georgia specifically. 
Plant Bogle is a nuclear power plant partially owned by Oglethorpe Power, our generation co-op. Currently, construction is underway to add two reactors at Plant Vogel. However, the unforeseen bankruptcy of the project's general contractor has put this project in jeopardy. Congress must extend the existing nuclear production tax credits in order to make this project's completion viable. Most of our country's food, minerals, energy, and manufactured goods still come from rural areas. That's why the health of rural America should be of interest of all members of Congress and all Americans. You have a great opportunity in the Farm Bill to make needed investments that will address our unique challenges. Again, thank you for the time to testify. Mr. Law. Thank you, Chairman Roberts, Ranking Member Stabenow, and members of the committee. Good morning, and thank you for this opportunity to testify on promoting the deployment and sustainability of broadband in rural America. My name is Denny Law. I'm the CEO of Golden West Telecommunications based in Wall, South Dakota. My remarks today are on behalf of Golden West and NTCA, the Rural Broadband Association, which represents approximately 850 community-based providers of advanced telecommunication services in the very most rural parts of this country. Golden West began operations in 1916, and today we provide broadband internet service, cable television, and voice telecommunication services. Golden West serves customers across 24,500 square miles in South Dakota. That's an area larger than the states of Maryland, New Jersey, Connecticut, and Delaware combined. Golden West has been an RUS borrower since the early 1950s, and just last week we received approval for our most recent loan. USDA's telecom lending programs have stimulated billions of dollars in private capital investment in rural telecommunications infrastructure around this country. Despite the tremendous success of the USDA telecom programs, rural broadband deployment would not be possible without the Universal Service Fund high cost program as well. The USF program helps rural carriers make the business case for network deployment through use of private capital and or securing loans from the rural utility service and the limited number of other private lenders committed to willing to finance broadband capable plant in rural America. Unfortunately, while USDA programs promote and the USF rules are designed to support robust networks, the high-cost USF budget is not. A hard cap and resulting budget shortfall is now driving consumer rates higher, deterring rural broadband investment, and even cutting USF support for investments that have already been made. In fact, in the nearly 40 percent of the U.S. landmass that is served by rural carriers, the artificially low, high-cost budget is now the greatest barrier to rural broadband investment that carriers face right now. Because of this limit, tens of thousands of rural consumers will see lower speeds or no broadband at all, precisely what recent reforms were intended to alleviate. We are requesting Congress to help press for a fix to this problem, and we urge the FCC to take action as promptly as possible to address this budget shortfall. The permitting, approval, and review process for deployment of networks across federal and state land-owning uh, land agencies must also be addressed in any holistic plan to promote and sustain infrastructure investment. The best-funded, best-planned networks may never deliver fully on their promise if they are caught in regulatory red tape and needless delay. Robust, robust broadband must be available affordable and sustainable for rural America to realize the economic, health care, education, and public safety benefits that advanced connectivity offers. Therefore, the rural broadband industry is eager to close the rural broadband gap by working with Congress and the administration on public policy that helps to build and sustain broadband in rural markets. Golden West and NTCA member companies thank the committee for its leadership and its interest on all of these issues and we look forward to working with you on behalf of the hundreds of small operator members of NTCA and the millions of rural Americans that we serve. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to your questions later. Thank you, Mr. Law. Dr. Shanks. Chairman Roberts and uh, Ranking Member Stabenow and committee members, I th thank you very much for this opportunity to testify, particularly about biomass utilization. Uh, clearly near and dear to the state of Iowa, but also broadly to the country. But I think what's important about this area relative to some of the other testimonials that we've heard today is this is one that not only impacts um, farm security, um, rural infrastructure, but also a broader impact on society. So it's a case where we can see that rural America really has a strong impact on the greater society. And I think that's an important thing to always uh, keep front and center. Title IX 
it has a very uh, important aspirational goal of, of producing advanced biofuels from biomass. And this is a wonderful aspirational goal. Uh, underneath that, we have, we've established the concept of a biorefinery, which would not only produce advanced biofuels, but also co-products of, of bio-based chemical or renewable chemicals and bio-based products. Importantly, the way this title is constructed is it looks at the challenge of that aspirational goal, which includes technological challenges, market challenges, and infrastructure challenges, and says, how do we build actions, authorize actions underneath it to address those challenges? And that's a very important way to look at the problem. But I would argue, or I would suggest there's another way, a complementary way to look at it, which is how do we take advanced biomanufacturing and to judiciously produce renewable chemicals and bio-based products that can actually enable us on the pathway to that grand vision that we have. What do I mean by judiciously? We can develop technologies that in the nearer term can produce renewable chemicals, but then as they mature can be leveraged into, into advanced biofuels. We can develop markets in renewable chemicals that will then be in place for when we're ready with all those pieces in the biorefinery to make it work. We can do incremental investment on existing infrastructure to, to make sure that when we come to the biorefinery, which will require a large capital infrastructure, we can lower that hurdle for that capital infrastructure. It's my opinion that if we utilize advanced uh, biomanufacturing to produce renewable chemicals, what we can do is create successes on the way to the pathway of what we ultimately want is uh, these advanced biofuels. The analogy I think of with this is when you think of NASA. NASA creates a vision and says, we're going to, the, to Mars. And what we do is we establish technologies along the way to that. But those technologies have value in their own right. And NASA does a wonderful job of articulating the value of that. I think we need to do the same thing in biomass utilization. We have a wonderful objective to create uh, advanced biofuels, but we also have the ability to create opportunities, successes on the way to that ultimate success. Thank you very much for your time. Mr. Olenek, thank you very much, Doctor. Thank you, Chairman Roberts, Ranking Member Stabenow, and distinguished members of the committee for inviting me to speak with you today. My name is Mark Olenek. I'm the President and CEO of Harvest Energy Solutions. We're a solar energy design, sales, and installation company based in Jackson, Michigan. I've been in and out of the agricultural sector most all my life. I was raised on a farm. I farmed on my own for a while. I was the farm manager for the largest farm in the state of Michigan in the early 1980s. I owned a grain elevator where we warehoused over 11 million bushels of grain for the USDA. I, after that, I got into manufacturing. But I missed the farmers and I missed the people of agriculture and I was looking for a way to reconnect with them. In 2006, I was approached to work in the renewable arena and thought this was my way back to working with farmers in the Midwest. We started a company called Harvest Energy Solutions. Over the past few years, we've grown from a two men and a truck operation to over 50 professionals and growing. Our main focus is farmers and rural customers in the states of Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, Ohio, Kentucky, Tennessee, Missouri, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania. Our agricultural customers include dairy, poultry, hog, grain, greenhouse, hop, fruit and vegetable farms, as well as wineries and breweries and food processors. We were pleased to be joined by you, Ranking Member Stabenow, in 2015 at a ribbon cutting ceremony for a solar installation at a winery in Northern Michigan. That project, like so many others in this space, was made possible by the USDA's REAP initiative. REAP grants are available through the USDA to assist farmers and rural business owners to invest in renewable energy systems or make energy efficient improvements. Harvest Energy has been successful in part because of the smart federal investments in rural communities like REAP. REAP has been a component of 25 to 30 percent of our sales. Allow me to give you a quick example of the immediate effect that REAP has on a solar investment. 
Typically, our customers will see a seven-year payback when they purchase solar for their farm or business, after which the electricity from that investment is virtually free. With the REAP grant award, the same farmer or business owner will see an approximate four-year return on investment. Many times, the REAP grant is the determining factor of their buying decision. There are typically three times more REAP grant applications than available funding in a given year. I would strongly recommend to this panel not only to reauthorize the program in the upcoming Farm Bill, but consider increasing the mandatory funding associated with it. That means more clean, renewable energy, more jobs, and economic growth in our struggling rural communities. I know that this committee has a lot of big decisions to make, but please know that Harvest and others like us deal with REAP conversations on a daily basis. I want to thank the committee again for inviting me to Washington, D.C. to share my perspective and the perspective of countless farmers and small rural business owners throughout the country. I look forward to your questions. Uh, we thank you, Mark. Senator Grassley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your courtesy, letting me go out of turn. Uh, Dr. Shanks, uh, given your research experience in biorenewables, what lessons uh, learned or specific effective practices do you feel should be included in the energy title of the Farm Bill in order to, for the U.S. to continue being a global leader in biorenewables? Uh, or... Thank you for that uh, question, uh, Senator Grassley. Um, I think always one of the challenges is how do you pose a problem and then, and then when the agency carries out that, uh, how they respond to the language. Um, as I mentioned in my testimony, the way we've currently set up is, is the vision of a biorefinery. And so most of the opportunities are set up around how do we impact the production of advanced biofuels. I think there's opportunity to say we need successes along the way, which let's, let's consider technologies that maybe aren't ready for advanced biofuels but can produce renewable chemicals that still have great value and get us on that path. And so I think th these are some of the things that we need to consider um, in terms of how do we get from where, from where we are to where we want to go. Yeah. Uh, next, uh, what are, uh, for you, Dr. Shanks, what are the prospects for advanced biofuels given the current crude oil price of about $50 a barrel? Because I think you indicated in what I read of your testimony that certainty of uh, petroleum product pricing would be beneficial, but if you're in a free market environment, I don't think you can expect that to be something Congress is going to decide. That's exactly right. Um, so I worked for Shell Oil Company, actually, before, so I've worked on both sides, both the, the oil side and the uh, renewable side, and that's absolutely correct. And so this is one of the challenges uh, when this, the target is primarily just a fuel, which is going to be very, very tightly uh, controlled relative to the price of crude oil. There is opportunities with the renewable chemicals, bio-based products that actually have advantaged and unique performance properties that create value proposition that are not as, that now you can decouple them to some degree from the price of fossil carbon. And that's a tremendously important part of the path forward, in my opinion. Why do you, uh, also for you, why do you characterize renewable chemicals as ancillary, ancillary in the uh, current biorefinery strategy? So again, when, when we look at the objective of a biorefinery, which is to make advanced biofuels, there's now an acknowledgement that there's an important role for bio-based products and renewable chemicals with that. However, the language that always comes out is how do we take the byproduct stream? How do we take the side streams that aren't being used for advanced biofuels? This is really limiting innovation and limiting our ability to make progress technologically on that way to that goal. Um, Mr. Haslin. Uh, I shouldn't say, what? Oh, I'm sorry, I, uh, I got one more question for you. Uh, in your testimony, you stated that the U.S. chemical market is over $200 billion in annual sales. What percent of the $200 billion do renewable chemicals currently account for? Additionally, are there any projections for where renewable chemicals might reasonably be in 10 years? Yes, yeah, so this is always a challenging question, and there's complete, uh, there are 
chemical consulting companies that make their business to, 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 uh, to project what that is. And so um, I'm certainly not in the position to, to be as definitive or as forward-looking as some of them. But we are, we are less than 1%. You can envision that 10% of that market is a reasonable capture strategy. Um, clearly, there's a number of things that have to be advanced to get to that point. To put it in a more concrete term, the state of Iowa passed a renewable chemical production tax credit. Uh, this is the first year that that's in place. It's five cents per pound of produced building block chemical from uh, renewable products. Already there are 15 companies looking at, at applying for that credit, which would be for production for this year that they'll officially apply for in, December, in January. So the answer is there's a lot of opportunity out there. There's a lot of innovation out there. So I, I think there's um, that 10 percent is not an unreasonable objective. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Heikamp. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this is an issue that is near and dear to my heart. Um, my colleague, Senator Hoven, and I represent one of the most rural states in America. And we appreciate and understand how critically important the rural development piece of this is. In fact, I, I, I have two tests on whether I think a rural area will survive. First is, do we have rural water, which is absolutely critical um, going forward for many, many families to make sure that the water is pure and clean. And the other test is, can they stream Netflix? Right? Because if you, can't, if you can't stream Netflix, if you can't get access to broadband, it's going to be increasingly more difficult, not only to keep our agricultural economy in these rural areas thriving, but to build out and develop value-added opportunities that will keep our children at home. And so we are very, very interested in making sure that the historic commitment that the federal government has made to rural development, which has paid off um, you know, either repayment of loans, but absolutely producing the highest quality food source in the world, making it possible for us to continue to do what we do in rural America. None of that would be possible if we hadn't electrified, if we haven't now looking at broadband, if we hadn't made these investments. And so I want to thank you all for the roles that all of you play in, in doing exactly that. Um, I want to talk a little bit about what would happen if, in fact, you probably all saw the budget that the administration um, advanced. Um, what would, and we'll start down at the end, and welcome, it's good to see you again. She used to work for Earl Palmer, so I had to give her a shout out. Um, you know, let's, let's just ask all of you what you think the consequences would be if we adopted this administration's um, budget as it relates to rural development, and we'll start on that end. Thank you, Senator. Um, well, certainly, a, um, we have to recognize that the rural development programs that are in place have no uh, rival in federal government. They are not, they are not duplicative to other programs. And um, we have to dedicate enough resources for these programs to do what they're designed to do, which is help these rural communities survive and thrive. And so we would say that any effort to, you know, reduce the resources to these programs will be detrimental to rural areas. Senator, when it comes to rural water, if the funding for the USD, from USDA rural development is not available, many of those projects will simply not be built. And what will, if I can just take a minute, what will happen to operation and maintenance and the opportunity not only to um, build new facilities but maintain what you currently have? The rural development uh, finances uh, uh, circuit rider programs, and we provide through our association as a technical assistance provider daily operation maintenance and technical funding uh, application assistance to those communities. Uh, the communities in Kansas and many across the Midwest are uh, have a declining uh, capital, uh, human capital. Uh, we typically have 25% turnover of operators annually in the state of Kansas. Uh, these field techs are essential to maintaining critical services. Milton Vale, Kansas, yesterday lost two operators, and one of our people is in there today uh, and was already yesterday afternoon helping that town maintain service. Thank you. Mr. Stevens? 
Thank you, Senator. We certainly appreciate this, and we, we really want to continue supporting the electric utilities, of course, and building out the basic infrastructure. We also see a need in continuing to support the, you know, the Rural Energy for America REAP program and energy efficiency, and also the Rural Energy Savings Program to help those, and also Red Leg and helping the economic development in our communities. Thank you. Mr. Long. Thank you, Senator. We would continue to support robust funding for broadband efforts, including the, the Rural Utility Services Broadband Development Programs, as well as the various grant programs that are available, as well as the traditional infrastructure program. It's my understanding that the, that the budget proposed for that is, is relatively stable at that time, but certainly as the process evolves, we will continue to advocate for strong funding. And if I can just make a point there, stable budget is not is going to maintain and help us keep what we've got. We desperately need to expand rural broadband, which uh, along with Shelley Capital, we're, we're working very hard in my office. If I can just get two more questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. There, uh, there's no question that infrastructure is tremendously important, uh, and even when we get into manufacturing of some of these products, we need to have that, that infrastructure. I, I would say what's also important is, is actually creating value in, the, in these communities, and, and a great example of that is three years ago, there was a $148 million facility built in Osage, Iowa, called uh, Valent Biosciences to make bio-based products. So there's great opportunity here as well. Thank you. If the uh, REAP grant uh, initiative was disbanded for whatever reason, uh, it would make it very difficult for uh, many farmers to dip their toe into renewables. We sell to farmers because typically they have space and they have friendly townships. Um, we look forward to working with this group and as I talk to hundreds or maybe thousands of farmers at different trade shows that we attend, they bring up REAP and they bring it up more and more all the time. So the momentum is growing and to pull the rug out for, under a program like this would be detrimental. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. Senator Hoven. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks to the witnesses for being here. Um, somewhat along the same lines, what are your priorities in the farm? I mean, as you look at small businesses, businesses throughout rural America, what are your priorities in the farm bill? Like one, two, three for, for each of you. Certainly, the reauthorization of the Rural Cooperative Development Grant Program is critical to providing resources for rural businesses developing in rural areas. And North Dakota has some excellent rural co-ops that have developed through this program. So reauthorization of Rural Cooperative Development Grant. The reauthorization of the Value Added Producer Grant and maintaining a strong business focus for that program. Uh, having applicants put together strong applications that include financial projections and estimates of customer base. Those are two key pieces uh, for what would be necessary in the next Farm Bill. But certainly looking at all these programs together to see how we can, how the programs work together to provide resources for rural development and how they can be done um, more cooperatively would be something that we would encourage. Thank you. Senator, I'm not intimately familiar with all aspects of the Farm Bill, but I do know about the Rural Development's Water and Wastewater Loan and Grant Program, and it is, uh, there are many more applications and funding needs than, is, than funding is presently available. And that is a critical component to uh, making water and wastewater services available in underserved and low-income, particularly rural communities. Senator, I think uh, for us, it's definitely continuing to meet the growth of our communities um, and providing funds to meet the electric service, also to providing innovative solutions like we've utilized for AMI and making a smarter grid, um, which could in include some form of broadband and also just continuing to promote economic development by reauthorizing Red Leg. Senator, we would strongly support continued uh, full authorization for the broadband loan program and the traditional telecom loan opportunities that, uh, that rural telecommunications providers can take advantage of for affordable financing of expensive broadband networks in very rural areas. And as many dollars are available for those types of applications to, uh, to further that mission would be our, our number one, number two, and number three. <laughs> I certainly can't claim the expertise in the, the broad aspects of the farming bill as a number of these experts. 
Uh, but I would say that I think an important aspect of a strategy for farm security and uh, rural investment is, is making sure that we actually have products that are valuable. And, and so we think that, that biomass-derived products are tremendously important in the mix of how to uh, help rural economy. And, what, and what's most helpful to you there? Pardon me? What is most helpful to you in developing those biomass? I, I, I think the key process there is, is to um, make sure we synergistically use our federal dollars. The Department of Energy has a very clear mission on energy. Um, uh, USDA, I think, has a m much more of a mission on, on rural, uh, uh, rural infrastructure uh, um, value to the, infra to, to, uh, to the rural society. I, I think that doesn't require that energy be the main feature of it. It means let's, how do we create value from the biomass? And so I think it's important to that those programs complement each other um, rather than just reinforce one direction. Still a little arcane for me. But. Okay. So um, a lot of what we do in the biomass area is absolutely related to making advanced biofuels. And that's a view across. So you're talking about the biofuel programs? The, the across bio multiple RFS agencies. And so yes, yes. Right. And I think those are important. However, USDA and the Farm Bill, I think, has a unique niche in there that what we care most about is how do we create value from the biomass products. We're... Energy isn't the absolute only end, end game that we would be interested in. We're interested in value-added products. And I think value-added products are a shorter-term advantage and success story potential than advanced biofuels. So like making a biomass coffee cup for the chairman of the Ag Committee. That <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I guess I would suggest jobs be the one of the my biggest concerns um, our young people are leaving the communities they're coming to big cities um, and in order to create some of those jobs um, I'm back to renewable energy Renew renewable energy produces jobs in those small communities it reduces the cost of electricity for the farmer allowing them to uh, expand their business and potentially hire more people uh, as, as well as the, uh, uh, the Guaranteed Loan Program. But there's something here that I'm learning today that I'm certainly not equipped to speak on, and that's the opioid condition we have in our rural communities. I think we all need to pay a lot of attention to that. Um, it's real, and uh, it's, it's a big concern. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Stabenow. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to each of you for your excellent testimony. Uh, Mr. Olenek, it's wonderful to see you again and appreciate uh, the great work that you're doing. I wondered if you could talk a little bit more about the REAP program uh, and the fact that uh, it's consistently oversubscribed. There's more interest than there is funding to be able uh, to move uh, these opportunities forward for farmers and others. Uh, we fought hard in the, the last farm bill to secure permanent funding for the program. And I wonder if you might talk broadly about the demand for rural uh, renewable energy projects, what you're seeing in the field, uh, what would happen in terms of jobs, jobs for your business, uh, as one example, if we were to increase the funding for REAP. Uh, thank you, Senator, for the question. Um, the more available REAP money, the more benefit to farmers and businesses, period. It produces jobs. I'll talk, I'll be greedy for a second and talk about my company. I mentioned that 25 or 30 percent of our growth has been direct, directly related to the REAP grant. We uh, not only sell and design uh, and, and uh, install uh, solar panels, but we have a manufacturing sector. Uh, we manufacturing the structure beneath the solar panels. So there would be increase in manufacturing, design, installation, sales, administrative, and these are professional jobs. They're not minimum wage jobs. Also on the agricultural side, as we educate these farmers one at a time, it seems like 
um, and they invest in renewables, it frees up money for them to expand their business. When they expand their business, uh, more jobs are, are had. Our business has doubled in about the last three years. I expect it to double again in the next three years or faster, certainly with an enhanced REIT program. The, I've got a quick story. It has to do with Kentucky. About six years ago, I wanted to show that somebody from Michigan can go sell someone from Kentucky a product. <laughs> so I, I myself went down there and I was introduced to a, a young farmer and we hit it off and he ended up buying a, a solar array from us. During that conversation, his neighbor was there. I thought I gave the first guy a really good deal, but we found out that that good deal spread and spread and spread and uh, they all got a pretty good deal. <laughs> Long story short, they almost all applied for a repair. Within five or six counties, we sold approximately 100 uh, uh, installations of solar in those five or six counties, almost all ap applied for a REIT grant. Most, I would say half got the REIT grant, half did not. But I would say that we could have had another 50 sales or so, uh, meaning more employment there, more employment for us, uh, had we had more funding for REIT. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Ronenbaum, uh, Let's talk a little bit more about rural water. Uh, you highlighted the affordability of drinking water, the importance of the USDA's Rural Development Water and Wastewater Loan and Grant Program in Kansas as well as across the country. Uh, we've certainly had a lot of challenges in Michigan from Flint, Michigan with the, the lead in water to Macomb County where there was a big, they called it sinkhole, but this huge effort where the road just collapsed and underneath it we saw pipes that I don't know what you call a pipe made out of wood, but that's what we saw, um, just extraordinarily old uh, infrastructure. According to the EPA's most recent drinking water infrastructure needs survey, $64.5 billion is needed to maintain and upgrade small water systems around the country. Um, as our nation's infrastructure continues to age, can you describe the role that USDA rural development programs have in ensuring communities? I know you've talked about this, but I wonder if you'd talk a little bit more on uh, what is being done to provide access to clean, affordable drinking water and any suggestions that you have in terms of USDA, in terms of being able to finance drinking water projects or provide technical assistance uh, in a more robust way. Thank you, Senator Stabenow. Uh, the EPA funded uh, public water supply loan funds in programs in various states focused primarily on compliance. In Kansas, in, as an example, when the state ranks the projects for funding by this, the regulatory agency, they apply 35 points to compliance or consolidation. Affordability gets five points. Affordability is at the bottom of their list, whereas the USDA program puts affordability very much to the top. Um, so those programs are not duplicitous. Uh, simply put, the, the, the focus is completely different. The USDA program replaces, expands, and extends services into unserved areas the EPA program cannot do that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Klobuchar, we have a vote at 12.15, another one at 1.45. I'm going to try to make this as brief as I can because I know you have uh, pertinent questions. Ms. Botts, in your testament, we have had a new arrangement here, Amy, where the last shall be first, and the first no problem. be last, but at uh, any rate. In your testimony, ma'am, you highlight important requirements uh, of the value-added producer grant program, specifically that applicants provide a business plan and basic uh, financial statements. Do you believe it makes sense to consider requiring this type of financial information for all USDA grant and loan business-based programs to ensure the projects being funded are actually viable? I do. I think uh, if, if the program is delivered to recipients who are 
private businesses, it only makes sense to have documentation that the business has thought through the very difficult questions they have to think through to do a business plan and that they do have basic financial statements such as a good profit loss statement so that the agency and the reviewers for the grant program can look at that and see that it is a viable going business. Thank you for that. If you see Earl Pomeroy in the near future, tell the uh, loquacious Mr. Pomeroy that I, I miss the dialogue back and forth between uh, he and I when we were on the House Ag Committee. I will do that. This is for uh, Denny. As you noted in your testimony, uh, Rural Development and administers a number of different loan and grant programs to encourage deployment of broadband all throughout uh, rural America. These programs have various definition of what speeds actually constitute uh, broadband. Do you think it makes sense to have a common definition of broadband? And if so, what speeds would you recommend a borrower's commit to build out in order to qualify for a, a grant or loan? Thank you for your, chair, or your question, uh, Chairman Roberts. I do believe that there should be some type of, of coalescence around a consistent speed designation for what constitutes broadband, uh, not just in rural America, but quite frankly, uh, America in general. Uh, in terms of, of speed standards, there are a variety in place today in terms of the Rural Utility Service. There are also a variety of speed standards uh, used by the Federal Communications Commission as well. I would strongly urge, if at all possible, there be some type of uh, meeting of the minds, so to speak, between those, uh, between those two entities to try to uh, uh, see what type of agreement or broad guidelines could be put in place for a consistent broadband speed standard. In regards to a specific speed, Mr. Chairman, uh, it, it is difficult. I, I will answer your question, but I'd like to preface it first by saying that will be an ever-evolving question that I, I'm confident this committee and, and others will ask for many years to come. The, the, the needs or, or desires of a particular network capabilities will evolve in years to come. And so whatever number I tell you today by the next month, next year, or five years, while we're all still building network, that number could, could be sub-performance. Uh, sub, uh, from a, a company perspective and, and my organization, and I think many in the rural telecommunications, I think a minimum broadband speed should start in the 25-3 in the territory. So 25 meg uh, broadband downloads and, and three meg up minimums uh, would be my personal recommendation, but that's written in sand because a year from now, it should be higher and, and so on. I appreciate that. A lot of things are written in sand around here. <laughs> Elmer, in your written testimony, you include a number of policy recommendations for the 2018 Farm Bill. One recommendation includes removing water and waste disposable technical assistance and training grants from the strategic economic uh, community development set aside. Can you expand on why you think this recommendation is the right way to go, why it makes sense, whether you believe there are other grant or loan programs where the multi-jurisdictional approach is not working as intended? Uh, Senator, that program, as I understand, takes 10 percent, 10 percent set aside at the national level. Whether or not that makes sense in the program, it would seem that each state could take its allocation and deal with a full 100 percent. But as it's presently written, it reduces the wastewater tech assistance program by 10 percent. We have one staff member who covers the entire state of Kansas. He measures lots of sludge in lagoons. I could give you some harrowing stories about getting high centered in a lagoon in a sludge boat, but we don't need that now. Uh, the, it, would, it would curtail services if those programs are reduced by 10 percent to many communities who need that assistance. I appreciate it. Thank you. If we have time afterwards here and I don't have to go to vote, I'll ask you about the governor stating that there is um, evidence now that the recharge for the Ogallala Reservoir actually is a better situation than we thought. And uh, I know you're from the eastern part of Kansas, but we have that reservoir out there. Thank you very much. Mark, have any of the uh, REAP awardees you have worked with over the years been agriculture producers located in non-rural areas? And I'm asking this because the program currently allows urban farmers sounds like the movie, uh, to qualify for funding. But as you noted in your testimony, this program is highly oversubscribed every year. 
Now, this might be a little controversial, but what are your thoughts regarding tightening eligibility requirements for rural Energy for America program awards to focus these dollars on providing benefits directly to agriculture producers in our rural communities? I guess I'm not sure I totally understand the question. Well, there's, there's money or funding going to urban uh, producers under a program that is for Rural Energy for America program awards to focus dollars on rural. Okay, I understand. Uh, it's, it's my understanding, and, and let me make sure I understand the question. Um, it is for farmers and small businesses in rural communities. But when they describe a farmer, they also, that farmer can also be closer to the urban area. That's, that's my understanding of, 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 the, uh, of the rules. So if, if someone is farming tobacco outside of Murray, Kentucky, and they're very close to the city, then I, well, that's not a very good example because Murray's not that big, uh, Louisville. And it's closer to the city and encompassed in an area that is too large or larger than a 50,000 population, the farmers are exempt from that and they can still get a loan or, or a grant. That's my understanding. Or just keep them outside the city limits. I'm good with that too. All right. I appreciate <laughs> that very much. Let's see if I. Um... Senator Klobuchar, why don't you close out? Okay, very good. Uh, thank you, all of you. Uh, and uh, I am co chair of the Senate Broadband Caucus, so I'm going to start with that. Um, and I've focused on, of course, our rural connectivity and what's going on. And we still, in this day and age, have way too many people that can't get broadband, including farmers, business people who, you know, go to the McDonald's parking lot to do their work. Um, so, Mr. Stevens and Mr. Law, uh, what steps do we need to take to help deploy broadband and how can we overcome the unique challenges that we have there? Thank you for the question, Senator, and I'll start. And at our co-op at Coweta Fade EMC, we currently are in the process of doing a feasibility to study to determine the benefit of building out a broadband network, specifically for our operational needs first. But our idea and our focus is to see how we can potentially partner with others um, to expand that to the unserved areas. Um, we see that it's not necessarily one size fits all. I mean, there's some co-ops who are um, working electric co-ops who are building that last mile. There's some who are not really focused on that and have, don't have any interest at this, at this time to do that. So, but what we see and what we believe is making sure there's ample funding for those co-ops and electric co-ops who are serving and building these networks, um, that their funding is available. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Senator Klobuchar, for your question. I think it's a combination of a couple of things. First is for the rural telecommunications providers that are already uh, in the business of providing broadband or trying to provide broadband across uh, rural expanses is is an effort to stabilize both the, the, the forms of revenue sources that rural carriers rely on, specifically the Universal Service Fund uh, in the first panel. Uh, Acting Administrator McLean referenced the uh, stability of the fund impacts our ability to make investments, our ability to keep rates affordable, our ability to provide comparable services, our ability to get loan funds uh, from, from your rural utility services. All of those things cascade uh, into, into impacting our ability to provide these services in a very difficult economic situation in rural America. The second thing I would briefly say is, is to ensure that we create the proper incentives to, to focus broadband providers to uh, invest in rural America uh, with the economic challenges. Okay, thank you. Mr. Olick, I know that Senator Stabenow asked you about uh, the rural energy um, um, part of the farm bill. And I'm gonna ask a related question. Uh, you talked about how REAP allows your clients to save electricity and money while making their operations more stable and profitable. Uh, how do you take advantage of the opportunities of the energy program, and as someone who works with REAP, what improvements do you think we could make uh, so that it's more effective for rural users? Uh, thank you for the question, Senator. There's one of the things that we've noticed with this, with the REAP program, and I'm going to give an example, uh, is that 
the maximum REAP loan or REAP grant is up to $500,000. Most all of the states typically don't even have REAP uh, opportunity of $5,000 or $500,000. I'll give you an example again. The state of Michigan in 2017, uh, we had allocation of $909,000. Well, one, one award was 500000 that leaves 409000 for all the other applicants. I suggest maybe that we should consider maybe a 20% maximum of the total allocation for the state. Mm -hmm. So this $500,000 recipient who took 55% of the total would have received $181,000, still a nice grant, but leaving $727,000 to be shared by smaller projects. In addition to that, the current legislation calls for a 20% funding for projects of less than 20,000. This is called restricted funding. I would increase the set aside to 40% for those smaller, those smaller farmers and small businesses, therefore spreading the wealth over more people and more farmers. Okay, very good. Well, I thank you all of you. I'll put some other questions on the record. So. No, we have to go to the vote, and the chairman has been very patient, so I'm going to end. Thank you. Well, Coop, it's high noon. It's high noon. Almost missed my window, Mr. Chairman, but yes, I'm sir. here. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I appreciate the, uh, the input from all of you. Thank you for your participation. And as I said earlier, um, when we look at farm bills, we look not only at, uh, obviously, the programs that benefit uh, directly uh, production agriculture, but also those things that can enhance uh, uh, quality of life in our rural communities. And, and the discussion today certainly uh, contributes to that. So, uh, Mr. Law, you uh, we talked a little bit about this, but what can be provided by rural development agencies or others that would enable your co op to provide broadband to your very widely dispersed customers at competitive rates? Thank you, Senator Thune, for the question. The, the, the funding sources for any rural telecommunications provider is really kind of a, a I'll say, a three-legged mechanism. There are the revenues we receive from customers. There are the revenues we receive from those who use our network. In other words, other carriers who may uh, desire capacity or need to, to use our network to, to transport uh, uh, their, their services. And then the third item for rural telecommunications providers is is the uh, is the support received from the federal universal for service uh, fund customer revenues and comparable and affordable certainly uh, i think we pushed the upper bounds of that today for most rural subscribers are paying uh, more for broadband and related telecommunication services than their urban counterparts in terms of the prices charged or the ability to generate revenue from third parties who use our network, that has been greatly diminished over the last years. And so now you're left with customer revenues and universal service funding. With universal service funding being dramatically reduced and cut for, for many companies, including my own, it doesn't leave many choices for where are the, are the future funds for the deployment of broadband networks. And so uh, it'll be a combination of, of customer increases uh, hopefully stabilization of the Universal Service Fund and potentially uh, restoral of, of amounts that have been cut over the last uh, 18 months. How, how um, do your rates for the services that you provide your customers compare to those in, say, for example, Rapid City or Sioux Falls? Sure. For, for a, a Golden West customer, in order to, because we operate in, in a high-cost uh, market, in order for uh, Golden West to even receive universal service support at the present time, our customers not only have to subscribe to uh, a broadband or for broadband, they also have to subscribe for voice telephone service. And, and it's not optional because if we forego the voice telephone service, there's a revenue from the voice service itself. But more importantly, we also at this point, uh, Golden West would forfeit any universal service funding. So it's really kind of a double, a double edge from the, from the funding side. To answer your question, Senator, what happens is for our customers to receive broadband, they have to subscribe to voice service and broadband service. And so that's a $100 charge. Uh, plus, we still receive some USF for that. Um, customers in a, in a more urban market in, 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 uh, in the surrounding areas, and, and I think probably for most of the committee members in your urban markets, I think a, a standalone broadband rate is probably much closer to $50 to $75. Ours begins at 100 and goes up from there. Mm -hmm. 
yeah, and issues that uh, need to we need to litigate with the FCC in addition to the other, uh, you know, the agencies we're talking about today. Um, you spoke of farm bill considerations for this committee. Is it fair to say that, in your opinion, the programs directly that uh, rural broadband that benefit rural broadband need increased funding rather than any major modifications? I mean, what's the... I would strongly support that, Senator. I think that, uh, as the committee has heard, there is a demand for rural broadband. There is a willingness by rural broadband providers to deploy more. And I believe if, the, if there was more funding mechanisms available, whether that was in the form of low interest loans, in the form of, of various grants or perhaps grant loan combinations, I believe there would be business cases that could be made for further expansion of broadband. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, yeah, I think that's, well, let me, I've got one here. Let me ask this of, of Ms. Botts. In your testimony, you spoke highly of the value-added producer grant program that you indicated that the planning grants are too long a turnaround time for many businesses, and you recommended a rolling application process for those planning grants with the uh, approval done on an expedited basis. Um, is this expedited process, in your opinion, something that rural development can enact administratively, or is there something this committee needs to do to clear the path for rural development to do this? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, it, my Thoughts would be that you would probably need to make a statutory change to allow them to consider planning grants separately from working capital applications. I don't know that for a fact, but I think that would probably be necessary because it would be a fundamental change to how they consider these applications. The reason I include it, though, even though it will be a challenge for them administratively, is because if you're a business and you're wanting to do a feasibility study uh, on a project, you don't want to wait for a full grant cycle. So we have many businesses that are agricultural producer started, businesses owned by ag producers that would be excellent value-added producer grant candidates for planning grants. Uh, they want to get started on their feasibility study as soon as possible. And so we would be able to do a lot more of those if, if we were able to do it on a rolling basis. I do think you would probably have to consider some sort of change. What's a, what's a fair turnaround time for an expedited approval process? I think it would have to be two to three months. Okay. Okay. Good. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Panel, thank you very much. Appreciate your input. Uh, we're here pretty quick, but uh, Mr. Olnick, uh, Mark, you uh, tweaked my interest on jobs, jobs, jobs for our, our rural areas, opportunities for our young people. Everybody knows here on the committee, and all of you know that's a serious problem. And uh, in Southeast Kansas, I was at able during the recent uh, break to t uh, visit three manufacturing plants. All three are similar from the standpoint that these jobs are somewhat technical, but they have a training program. Uh, the pay is significant. Uh, very quickly, any applicant that is accepted and works on the job can get over $20 an hour. Uh, plants range in size 100 to 500. They actually go out and try to recruit uh, workers. Helmer uh, talked about this a little bit with regards to uh, people who change or leave, and you have to come in with a substitute here, with regard to uh, all that you're involved with. What I'm trying to get at is that um, they tell me that in recruiting the whole area, high schools, um, our community college, et cetera, et cetera. One in five, actually, uh, they can accept. One in five. And I ask, what, what's going on here? Well, you have to fill out a written form, number one. Number two, you have to have a personal interview. And number three, you have to take a drug test. And if you're only accepting one in five because of what I would think to be a basic requirement here, uh, we're in a world of trouble. And I'm asking about the work ethic. They also indicate that they may pass, they go through the training, they're on the job for maybe a month or two and they quit. Uh, I think that's very troubling. You can also apply that to uh, the United States Marine Corps. It's one in 10 that walk through a recruiter's office door who are actually uh, fit the requirement, I would admit that the criteria, or I'm very proud to say the criteria is pretty high there. 
I'm worried about this generation's work ethic with regards to jobs that are available, but the people simply do not want to do that. There's a health uh, program here, there's a retirement program here. Uh, you get to stay in your hometown, or, and I would think if you can find a job you like and you can make a living while we're all in a small town, area is the best place you can do, or, or be. Would you like to comment about that? Your sentiments are exactly the same as mine. Um, we have, uh, be between my wife and myself, we have six kids. One lives in Ann Arbor. One lives in New York City. One lives in San Francisco. One lives in North Carolina. And two are local. Um, and they're all educated. But the people that we hire and that we try to hire are from all over uh, the area. And you're right. I would say one in five for our area might be doing well. Um, part of our company, we're afraid to even drug test. We might lose half the people. And that's common. That's common in our area. It's probably common in your area, even though you might not know it. Uh, so it's a, it's a serious problem. And as far as the work ethic goes, um, it's tough. I don't, I don't see the generation wanting to come in on weekends. But sometimes we'll offer a day off without pay, and, and they'll take it, as opposed to uh, working over the weekend. Uh, so, um, you know, it's, it's very difficult, and we're all involved at the rural community, but it's a serious problem. They le they're, they're leaving if they're educated, and they're struggling to want to work if they're less educated. Albert, you want to comment on that? Uh, my wife taught gifted education and school for 30-some years. There are many societal pressures on families. Uh, I am not familiar with the, the drug issues that many of them are personally. Uh, I know that that's a real problem. Uh, there are local manufacturers, uh, local hometown boys like Don Landel in Marysville, who's done very well. Mm. Uh, manufacturing companies in Sabetha, Kansas and Seneca, Kansas. Uh, they struggle to have uh, manufacturing type jobs uh, that pay and can attract uh, a quality workforce. But I agree with the sentiments that there is a less and less work ethic. The community facilities programs that we operated in, we use self-help. They were volunteer services to just build a new community building or a library a fire station, and in some cases we, we repaired uh, nine water systems. We used local volunteers, and it was a sweat equity program. We supervised the projects. There has to be more stakeholder involvement in local communities so that they feel that they have an ownership and that they have a value and a worth and that they've contributed something to maintain and improve their local quality of life. My staff is informing me that this uh, vote will be over with at 12:15. Uh, we don't want to. I don't want to miss that. Anybody else would like to contribute? I raised that issue simply because Mark, you know, brought up jobs, and I got to thinking about it. I didn't realize. I knew we had a problem, but I didn't realize we had that big a problem with regards to one in five. And for jobs that are good jobs, and it, and it wasn't so much that they uh, that, that, that the jobs were not available. Uh, this goes from county to county. You mentioned Sabetha. I'm always amazed we have a traffic jam in Sabetha, Kansas, but uh, that, because of the manufacturing there. Uh, home of the Fighting Blue Jays, as you know. Anybody else want to comment on this? Just to echo what's been said, the businesses with whom we work are constantly struggling to find labor. It is a constant struggle. We answer more questions on that and how to deal with labor issues than probably any other issue. So now we have to find a way. That's going to conclude our hearing. I didn't mean to end it on a down note, but I think it's a very serious problem. Thanks to each of our witnesses for taking time to share your views on the rural development and energy programs under the Farm Bill. Your testimony <clears throat> was extremely valuable to us, and it was certainly necessary for the committee to hear firsthand. <clears throat> Pardon me. 
And for those in the audience who want to provide additional thoughts on the Farm Bill and these subjects, we have set up an address on the Senate Ag Committee's website to collect your input. Please go to ag.senate.gov, click on the Farm Bill hearing box on the left hand side of the screen. That link will be open for five business days following today's hearing. And to my fellow members, we would ask that any additional questions you may have for the record be submitted to committee clerk no later than five business days from today or 5 p.m. next Thursday on, on October 5th. The committee stands adjourned. Thank you.